And I think, you know, the highlight of my career was um, not too many months ago when the Ingenuity helicopter made its first flight on Mars. Oh, cool. And I haven't and I haven't said it yet here. The relevance of that is because when I was on that program in Qualcomm, um, JPL reached out to us. They wanted to use our hardware in that helicopter. This is going back to 2017. This is awesome. When they were looking at it. And so they actually end up selecting my hardware design um, for their main um, flight controller and camera system. It's awesome. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Vinny Kemmler. Uh, Vinny is the Director of Hardware Engineering for Modal AI. Uh, they're a Qualcomm spinoff from a few years ago. They do small unmanned aerial systems for the DoD. Vinny, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. Yeah, so um, I guess, how did you get into uh, aerial systems? How did you get into hardware? Uh, what, what made you want to go down this road? So... It depends on how far back you want to go. I mean, do you want to go back to like why engineering or more why drone type stuff? I guess that's a good question. Let's start with why engineering uh, and then go why drone. And if I'm at any point keeping you from your wife and kids, we can uh, <laughs> no, you're good. it short. They'll be, they'll be okay for a couple hours. I'm sure she'll let me know if I, if I need to uh, hurry it up. Perfect. Um, honestly, when I was in high school, I was really big into car stereo systems and loud, very loud music. I was that guy driving down the street, you can hear him like two blocks away. What were you listening that was to? Me. So when I was in high school, it was mostly, believe it or not, you might laugh, um, literally called bass music. It's bass just music. literally, okay. it's just literally just hard, just heavy bass. It just, it's all about the, the Is that the kind of like drum and bass or is that, is that something different? It's, it's a, like a little mix of that with, uh, like a little bit of like house type thing. And it's just really oh, cool. just a lot yeah, of- I was, I was thinking of trance back in, back in the late nineties, early two thousands, so. Yeah, that's exactly when it was. I, it was, you know, mid nineties and, uh, you know, my neighborhood knew me as the guy, if you want to get your car stereo installed, they would come to me. And I kind of just really picked up on that. And what was funny was, uh, even though I was the one that knew how to do all that stuff, I never knew what any of the specs were. Like if I would go buy a receiver or an amp or a subwoofer and I would just, look at the box and have no clue what I was reading. <laughs> I, just, I just knew, okay, this is what it takes to make it loud. <laughs> and I, I knew see. how to hook it up. And so did you I read guess the instructions or did you just mess with it until you got it right? I pretty much just messed with it right yes. away. I was usually pretty, you know, the, you know, color coded RCA jacks and yeah, pretty it's easy impossible battery up. plus minus. Yeah. It was, it was fun to tinker with them back then. You could work on your cars, you know, you can put cables between the fire panels and under the seats and all that. Oh yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare try that now. Uh, and so I just it kind of drove my curiosity. Um, when I was 16, I built my own. That was also the time when it was popular to have massive speakers in your house when you had your entire nice. entertainment system. The right. I mean, if, I don't I know how up, old you are. But we I had seven foot polks when I was growing up in the house with a Carver amp. Yeah. No, no, it was a Denon amp. There was a, there was a Carver tape deck on it. That thing was sweet. I mean, like now it's all about the seventy inch plus TVs. But when I was you know in teenage the, years, it was how mark. big of a audio, yeah how big of an audio rack do you have, and how much you know, how many receivers and amps and equalizers all separate units, and how big are your speakers? I'm still running that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I've got a, I've got a Sherwood tube amp from the '60s, and I've got nice. a Pioneer from the '80s that I run uh, nice. back back home. Yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah, Pioneer is my go-to brand. Man. Oh, they're sweet. And then, like, yeah. the brushed aluminum fronts on them and the stainless, like, look. I think it's aluminum, but I love that stuff. It makes me really happy. Yeah. And so I just it just really drove my curiosity. I just really wanted to understand how that all worked. And in my kind of, like, I guess junior, senior of high school, I started getting flyers in the mail from random colleges, and one of them was about engineering. And I didn't know anything about engineering or what it was. And... uh I said, okay, well, this kind of sounds like it might be interesting or relevant to me, so let me try it out. And I applied and got accepted into one school with a really great scholarship option. That's awesome. And I didn't even know what brand of engineering I wanted to get into. So Same. I was really fortunate that my college offered, as part of their freshman engineering curriculum, an exposure to all the different types of engineering. That's pretty Chem awesome. Yeah, chemical, mechanical, electrical, civil, all of it. And wow, that really, really is the gamut. 
Yeah, and so I really just did tune into the electrical. That was the most exciting to me. And, and uh, that was kind of then, what, by the time I was a sophomore, I just kind of went with that path. That's and awesome. I just always loved electronics. And so anytime I could take any electronics class, I was un, I was in that class. Oh, same. I mean, so I, I started messing with electronics when I was like seven years old and, you know, just kind of tinkering all throughout my life. Yeah. It was the same thing. I mean, I, I ended up in computer science because I ended up uh, getting hooked by a mentor in uh, freshman year. He gave yeah. me an office and I felt special. So I just went that direction instead. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I know, it's, it's it's probably, I wish I knew a little more computer science these days because everything is now programmed. Well, now I'm a hardware guy, so it's a useless yeah. degree to me. I kind of wasted <laughs> a bunch of money and time. Well, most of my hardware just sits on a bench until the software engineer picks it up and does something with uh, it. That's exactly it in robotics. It's just a paperweight until you add software. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and so, so I just really like electronics. And I think part of it was also when I was really young, when my dad was around, he used to futz with old tube radios and oh, amps cool. and stuff like that. I love that stuff. I used to go back into his, uh, you know, I forget what we called it, like the back room, whatever, where he would, you know, hang out with a cigar and play uh, with his things. Sounds awesome. And I just, I love the fact that as I started to learn this stuff, I can actually have conversations with him. And I thought that was really kind of cool. I can say, hey, dad, I learned what a capacitor was today. You know, I learned what a transistor was. <laughs> and he's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. So it was just like, it was just a good way to break conversation with him because my dad was kind of tough to talk to growing up. That's cool. Uh, so, it was, so it was kind of like it was a nice little, it was a combination of fulfilling my curiosity and bridging, you know, I guess some of that other, you know, other personal divides, I guess. Was there anyone that mentored you as a kid, uh, like on the stereo stuff at all? No, that I just picked up all on my own. Actually, believe it or not, I learned most of my stuff you're going to laugh and I'm not trying to give an advertisement to anybody. It's all good. Crutch, I used to, I just, I okay, loved cool. the Crutchfield magazines and I would go and, and call them and ask them for all their user guides that they made. Like, I'm like, just whatever user guides they had, I would just, I would just absorb them. And, uh, and I also liked, I, I, when I was a kid, it was Radio Shack was still around. Oh yeah. Did you, did you hit them when they, uh, they went out of business and they were doing 10 cents on the dollar components? I, I was not near one at the time. I kind of regret it, but um, I probably had five and I kind of regret it. I, I spent so much money on like unreliable relays and switches. And yeah. bulbs. I, I just remember, I, you know, half my allowance went to video games and the other half went to, I would just go to Radio Shack and like pick up these little books. Oh, Radio like, Shack 10 times out of 10 for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it was just, you know, how to design a circuit, how to, how to design an LED circuit, just all these kind of, and I, and I had no idea what I was reading. Did you ever get the, like, <laughs> just, the encyclopedia of electronic circuits? Yeah, I got like these little pamphlets that they were, they were printed on what appeared to be graph paper. I can visualize them. I just can't remember nice. what they were called. And they were, they were literally circuit design examples, like where we had a breadboard and stuff. And I used to kind of play with these things. And uh, That's awesome. Yeah, so a lot of it was just kind of self-involved. Uh, my best friend growing up, he was more into the me hands-on mechanical. So he actually went into so the good guy to be friends route. with. <laughs> yeah, so he he went more into the HVAC route, you know. So he you know he's really he's actually the head of he's almost the head of engi building engineering at the S and P five hundred building in Manhattan. Holy crap! And so I keep, I keep in good touch with him, and I get some really cool stories about that. And you know, he's a pretty big deal there. That's all, that's so like kind of interesting how get in that world. That's awesome. Yeah, he's like one step below the chief, and and you know from the building engineering. Um, and so it's kind of so he kind of helped motivate me to make sure I didn't you know do nothing, I guess, because he kind of went on, you know, he was a couple years older than me. So I kind of wanted to follow in his footsteps and at least make sure I kept going, you know, after college, after high school, that there was, you know, more to go. Because where I grew up, I'm from Staten Island. You know, a lot of people, they're done with high school and that's it, they're done. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not a lot of people go to college when I was growing up in that community. So Makes that sense. was like an example of, okay, there's more after high school. And then I just, that kind of just kind of made it a de facto, you got to do it kind of thing. And then I guess, well, if I'm going to do it, might as well do something that's interesting. Yeah, that's and awesome. That's kind of how that happens. Did your folks go to college? Were you the first one or I'm guessing? Uh, all my sisters did, but my mom and dad only did kind of like certification type things when Makes they sense. were younger. I mean, that's respectable um, too. I think we've got degree inflation now. We're like a college degree today, like a bachelor's is what an associate's used to be. You know, it's just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotta have no, I'm really glad I went the engineering route because yeah, it's absolutely. you come out right away as a professional yeah. and valuable yeah. and, and you can contribute to society right away and you can do some really cool things. And I have a whole history of cool things that I've been involved in that, uh, you know, kind of excited to share. Let's with talk you about tonight. some of those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned drones. I mean, is there anything else you want to start? I mean, we kind of just keep it free form. So I'm happy to. 
to go. Yeah, I mean, I can go to the crux of my career right now if you want. I think we can work up to it. We can go right to it. Uh, whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, you know, we can we can backtrack as you want, but cool. you know, I'd love. Done. I can hang my hat on that. You know, when I was at Qualcomm, um, I was part of their. You know, they had they weren't in drones until 2014 was when they started that program, and they they tapped me to be the hardware lead for that effort because I was ramping down on another project as a hardware lead. And so they were like, oh, let's, you know, it'd be good to get Vinny on this project. I knew, I told them, listen, I know nothing about robotics, drones, motor controls, absolutely nothing. I mean, and good like, on you for being upfront about it, right? I mean, that's yeah. the guy you want to work with all the time. <laughs> and and it was great because it, it you know, it, it, it drives that hunger for knowledge and thirst and to know what you, you know, people respected me for being someone that I knew what I talked about. And if I didn't, I was honest about it. And so I think that, you know, that was kind of nice that I was always honest with them saying like, Hey, listen, I don't know what motor controls are for this. I have to, you know, I was doing, you know, like uh, cell phone type stuff and cell tower type stuff to then parlay that into robotics was, you know, very interesting. Um, That's and cool. then, I mean, how did you catch up? Did I like, find you just learned, uh, sorry to, to get tension. No, no, go for it. Go for it. I was, I was just going to say, like, oftentimes when I'm in a job where there's there's a skill set I don't know, I, I find I'm the most effective if I just throw myself at a task and try to learn it to accomplish the task. But I know some people prefer to, like, do a training or, or you know, read a few books on it first and then go that way. What's what's your approach to kind of picking up a new It depends. I, I like a combination approach um, with the definite of repeat and reinforcement. So, for instance, if there's something completely new I never heard of before, I do like to read up about it a little bit self-exposed, self-absorbed, and then if available, do a training. Cool. And then maybe even go back and reread some of that material because a lot of times when you're looking at material for the first time, you can kind of gloss over some of the key points. And then if you have someone that's an expert in that field, kind of help tutor you a little bit. Yeah. And they can key you in on those important points. And then when, so when you go back and reread that material you read the first time, you read it in a different way. That's awesome. And I think, and I think that kind of helps reinforce it. Like a perfect example, and I don't, you know, a perfect example is when I do any kind of um, outside of work, I used to be really into uh, firearms training. Cool. And I think that's a perfect example of an equivalent where you first get into it and you don't know what to do. So you, you go to the range with a couple of buddies, you know, maybe you have your dad or someone's uncle show you what to do. I thought but I was then crossing I, my fingers, fingers up until recently when somebody, somebody showed me not to do that. that. <laughs> yeah. And I, I took some legit professional training um, at a really you know well-respected facility. And, and then when I go back and kind of review like, what I thought I knew and the videos that I watched before, I, I just look at it in a different way and it helps reinforce. Now I go back to the range and I can try to count a combination of what I learned from some of us, what I already knew worked and just kind of blend it together. I always, I always think that all my knowledge is a blend of everything that I've gotten. How do you catch yourself? My own personal... oh, What's that? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I, I want to keep listening. I need to cut you off. No, you're good. I was going to say, how do you catch yourself in a bad habit at the range? Um, like how do you, cause I feel like when I'm doing it, I'm blind to it. Like it's, you know, I mean, I, I know what I'm supposed to do, but like, you know, I anticipate or I cross my thumbs or, you know, my sense is all goofy. And it's, it's well, very difficult call unless there's someone else there that's smarter, you know, that, that knows. The, the paper targets don't lie, right? If yeah. You, <laughs> yeah, you go, you go recover your paper target and you see a bunch, you know, here and some there and some, you're like, what the heck was this? What, what, <laughs> what was I doing? doing? Yeah. yeah. But I used, I used to play tennis as a kid, and I remember there were times when my game was horrible, but, like, the coach would commend me for having really good form. And then there were other times when, like, I was winning, but, like, I would get chastised for having crappy form, you know? And so, I don't know. I feel like it's... It, it definitely, I totally agree with you. I, I Naturally, I become a teacher in a lot of situations, both at work, my professional life, and in my private life, where... Like whether I'm at work and there's an, a new a new college grad or an intern that doesn't know the circuits, or whether I'm at the range and I see someone struggling, yeah, and and you know and I'm you know okay I, I have some downtime I did what I wanted to do maybe I can go help that person I'll ask them if they want some training or I'll ask you know the new hires or whatever hey do you want me to show you how that circuit works I just I guess I naturally like to show people what I know and I think that's, that's a continuous reinforcement on doing it yourself the right way as well. <laughs> You learn so much when you teach. I, I couldn't agree more. Exactly. Because you yeah. have to break down the thought process and, and really analyze it. And I mean, you, you knew yeah, so, you uh, noticed before. Yeah, I don't think I truly know something unless I can explain it clearly to someone else. 
yeah. where I know I'm not bullshitting them. I think that's an Einstein and, quote. Like, if you can't explain to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. Yeah, and and yeah, totally. So I think that's that's how I try to just make sure I really I'm honest with myself as well. You know, if I don't know it, I'm gonna admit I don't know it. Or yeah, same. I didn't used to I be that way. I was I was an arrogant bastard a few years ago, and I feel like I've kind of grown into it. But I'm yeah, happier. What, People seem to respect me more. That's <laughs> a better way to be. I think what also helped in my professional life working at Qualcomm for 13 years. There are so many smart. Oh, you get humbled, folks. They will just call you out. That's right exactly. There in yeah. Well, in and, school, and, it's easy to be the smartest, hottest, you know, hot dog yeah. of them all. And then when you get out in industry, I mean, you see people that have been doing it, you know, decades that are, you know, they've seen every single failure mode. I mean, they were working when you were in your daddy's balls, you know, and like, exactly. you know, it's just like, yeah, you're wrong. You know, you're like, well, who are you? So, like, I'm this person that's been doing it way longer. And they're like, oh, all right. Yeah, I was, it's funny. I was yes, telling sir. my wife, how, I was telling my wife the other day how there was one of these new uh, college grads at a company. And I heard these two guys kind of over talking with each other. And he's like, yeah, you know, tomorrow's my 20th birthday. And I looked over and I, and I wanted to say, oh, my God, I've been working for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I'm getting old. I yeah. feel that way a lot. <laughs> but it, it's, you know, it's all it's all fun. I mean, I think. I mean, who I am is fundamentally an engineer because and I think that sets a lot of both my successes my understanding of life and society, people, even family, in a lot of ways. I think I'm really proud to be an engineer. Yeah, same. And I love that that path I took was a, a great, honest, truthful, reputable path that has gotten me into a lot of great situations. It's gotten me a lot of great exposure. Yeah, you think a museum um, is cool, right? <laughs> Try being yeah. there when the stuff's being made for the first yeah. time. And I think, you know, the highlight of my career was um, not too many months ago when the ingenuity helicopter made its first flight on mars oh cool and i haven't and i haven't said it yet here the relevance of that is because when i was on that program at qualcomm um jpl reached out to us they wanted to use our hardware in that helicopter this is going back to 2017 this is awesome when they were looking at it. and so they actually ended up selecting my hardware design That's... um for their main um flight controller and camera system it's awesome and it was a process, and we you know, we went up to JPL in 2018 to assist them on site, and that was pretty cool. My I know my uh, my CEO posts that a few times on their Twitter account for Model AI about how the Model AI founders helped contribute to the JPL Ingenuity helicopter. That's incredible. Like, like that program, and I can hang my hat on the fact that that's my hardware in the helicopter, and I got invited to the special like uh, landing parties with JPL folks. That's awesome. Um, I got invited to all these like special meetings to like do all these uh, viewing things. And the fact that it actually did, you know, fly is, is pretty crazy. It's like none of my uh, stuff's ever flown on Mars. <laughs> that's incredible. And so that's, that's kind of at, at the professional level. That's one of the things I'm kind of most proud about that I can say that to like my family and like, even like my mom gets it. Like my mom who doesn't really understand technology. She doesn't really know how to use a cell phone. When she saw that broadcast about the helicopter, she called me. She's like, was that the thing that you're involved in? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I'm like, yes, mom. That was the thing I was involved in. She's like, well, I'm so proud of you. I'm like, well, you know. The JPL folks did all the work, but I contributed. <laughs> I mean, we're just meeting and I'm proud of you. Like, that's that's an incredible accomplishment. Yeah, so I think – and so it's kind of interesting that there's – you know, I can't really say much, but I know, you know, there's more to come, I think, with JPL, hopefully, and Moto AI, I, I hope. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, we have a lot of cool things. Um so we'll see. There might be some more milestones in my in my professional career going forward. So we'll see what happens. Definitely excited and to then, see what yeah. comes there. Yeah. And then I'm also the one that knows that, you know, I'm not the only one. I mean, even though that's fundamentally my hardware design, I had so much help, you know, at the time, all the so support groups there. How did that come to be? I guess, what was the actual hardware and how did your involvement stem? What was some of the process in getting that to, into the chain of commerce? Yeah, so, so that, that project at Qualcomm was all about bringing – their flagship Snapdragon processes that are in everyone's, you know, uh, phone, um, except for Apple phones. Um, they wanted to get that into the robotics space. Like their whole mantra was, okay, everyone's got a phone. So how do we get them to buy more than one Snapdragon chip? That's interesting. Like, okay, well, Cause I've seen, I've those. seen cell phones strapped to robots. Like we had a client like maybe seven years ago that was doing that. And they basically were... that, and that's what we started with was yeah. the, the precursor to our project was they were just using the phone by itself. 
and to with like mirrors and stuff for the for the cameras to get the right angle they wanted. And seeing then, that too, that's awesome. Yeah, hooking up USB uh, motor controllers, um, and so fundamentally was the point was that you know they everyone knew that you know, Snapdragon at the time was a, a very powerful processor that can do a whole bunch. And so how cool would it be to take those capabilities of a smartphone with connectivity, camera, sensory type of things and put it into a robot? Yeah. And so our, so our project did that. And then when we marketed it, um, when Qualcomm marketed it, it, you know, it got a lot of buzz at CES. Nice. Because um, it was every CES. And then I guess somehow JPL yeah, picked up on it. huge for a lot of markets. And then I guess, you know, they wanted, you know, a, a very powerful flight controller that had integrated camera support, sensory support. Because at the time we were doing it, you know, the most sophisticated, you know, drones at the time had four, five, six, seven different hardware boards. And here we were doing it with like one, maybe two, depending on if you wanted some extra companion thing. Nice. And so the, I think the level of integration is what kind of stoked JPL into looking at us and trying to, trying us out. So just ready to go and out of the box. We, they probably wanted convenience yeah. at first and they saw performance and they were hooked. Yeah. And the thing is, I think, you know, they appreciated the fact that we were working with them. Like we didn't, you know, we're not, you know, people that I like to work with, you know, we're not arrogant in that we say, this is our design. You must use it as it is. No, it's like JPL has a whole different set of constraints, which I always laugh at this one. I always, I, anyone that understands engineering, electrical engineering in particular, understands that like thermal and heat is kind of like the one of the most important design constraints that you need to work around and where you got to put heat sinks and fans and blowers and stuff to get the heat away. And I find it hysterical yeah. that JPL has to heat our board. <laughs> <laughs> Because otherwise they can't survive the cold Martian nights. That It'll freeze. Sense. Well, how cool does it get over there, if I can ask? I don't recall the numbers, I'll be honest with you, but it was pretty darn cold. Um, I've seen I've seen sensors getting heated up with blow torches uh, in the Field Robotics Center here at Carnegie Mellon. So there's a subterranean I think our mutual friend, uh, Andrew, worked on that. Yeah. And um, this guy, Chuck Whitaker, who's, Red Whitaker is a little more well-known, but it's his brother. He's like the shop master. He's a good dude. I want to get him on the pod at some point. Yeah. And uh, he was telling me stories about being in a cave and, and just, you know, as cold as, as all. And they had to <laughs> heat this fucking sensor up with a blowtorch, like a sick, you know, multi-thousand dollar <laughs> sensor. <laughs> I would have been terrified. Yeah. Sometimes you got to do that. And that's, you know, for anyone that listens to your podcast that doesn't, you know, if they're young enough to kind of decide their career path, I mean, engineering's not all uh, glamorous and glistening. We can glam. sometimes one, you know. We've, we've yeah, sometimes you got to break out blow torches and free sprays and ice cubes, and you know, we've, <laughs> like at times we actually use the real. Yeah, at times we've used a real refrigerator instead of a temperature control chamber. I mean, you know, you never know. You just, awesome. just got to make it work. That reminds um, me of something like, I did extracurricularly uh, in my yeah. in my free time. So we used to brew beer all the time when I was an undergrad in college. Nice. And um, thank you. And so we decided to get into box, which is like a type of lager, and you have to brew it at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And so uh, I'm in the Northeast. It's like usually around 70 here. So you need to refrigerate it to make it make it brew right. Um, and so we didn't know this when we started brewing the beer. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, we got to that part of the instructions. We're like, oh, shit, what do we do? And so it was, it was just like a four hour hack with an Arduino and a relay and like a soldering iron. And, and we got that fridge, uh, you know, to kind of hover within three degrees Fahrenheit or where we needed it. And, you know, that's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. fun. You know, and it's cool. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, the true good engineers out there are the ones that adapt that to, to quote, not quote directly, but anecdotally quote the, the Marine mantra of improvise, adapt, overcome. I love that. I, th I think any good engineer worth it, worth his uh, worth his weight in gold has to kind of also take on that mantra of just you got to sometimes just do what it takes and make it work. Wait, what is the mantra again? Uh, just you know, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. I love that. I've Basically, heard use, lose, or modify from army guys. So that's okay. why I, was, I was just trying to. Get that's my that. understanding of a marine. You know, I'm not military. I'm, unfortunately, I have all the respect for the military. And, and from my yeah, I understanding, veteran in here two nights ago. So. Yeah. Uh, for my best understanding, that's a Marine saying yeah. uh, to improvise, adapt, and overcome. Yeah, and I think that you know it, it applies equally well on anyone that needs to solve a challenge. That you don't, you're not always given the best tools, yeah, or the best resources. Of course, but, but if, if you, you sit on your hands and you don't do anything because you don't have the perfect tool, then you're way more useless than you know. Exactly. Yeah, you're, like you're guaranteed to tool. fail if you don't try, right? Absolutely. So. I like that one. You miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take. So I'll use that. Yeah. One, there you go. You know? Yeah. Or Zig Ziglar said, uh, it's, I mean, I know this doesn't get a whole lot of respect from engineers, but he's a salesman. He's like one of the best American salesmen to ever live. 
and he said, um, what was it? Uh, fall forward. So like, even if you mess up, oh, and right. you, don't, you don't make it, at least you tried, you know, and, and keep going. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I love, you know, and I definitely did experience this a lot at, at Qualcomm, which is nice. And, and a lot of that mentality fall through at, at Model AI, uh, the team there where we're not afraid to fail. Um, you, you, you just got to try and see what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, you're not going to always be perfect your first time at doing something. Um, yeah. And if you are, you're probably not trying to do something interesting. <laughs> exactly. Then you, yeah, you're just re probably repeating what someone else already did. Um, so, and I think, you know, all those kind of mentalities that, you know, I, I adopted from the engineering, you know, uh, career path is I like the fact that it actually influences my personal life in a lot of ways. That's interesting. And, How uh, so? I think I'm, I'm, a better, I'm probably a better family man for, for that. Right. Nice. You know, just the, you know, I'm a new dad and, you know, my, my son was born. Uh, thank you. Last April in the height of the beginning of the pandemic. Congratulations, man. That's awesome. You got a COVID yes. baby. Well, you didn't get no, a COVID no, baby. No, no, you got a pre-COVID baby. <laughs> we had it right in the beginning. It was, uh, he's April 8th. And so. 2021 2020. Okay. So but conceived before COVID. Cause that, that was the theory is a lot of people would have kids like Correct. around now. Cause of, Okay. That's why. Yeah, I yeah, I, I predicted as well. My wife is going to be either a lot of divorces and a lot of babies come, you know, nine to ten months after COVID started. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so right. He was conceived pre-COVID, but he was born in the height of the no toilet paper, no bacon, <laughs> no eggs, no milk, no formula, no diapers. Holy crap! It was like, what the hell do we do? Like, any, anytime we had the appointments, sounds with, like uh, you got to breastfeed and get a bidet. Oh my goodness! It was it was pretty scary. It was yeah. it was really scary at first to try to deal with that situation, but. You know, going back to that whole thing is like, you know, we just try to make it work, improvise. You know, it's like I told my wife, listen, if we can get eggs or fresh fruit, you have it. You're you're feeding, you're breastfeeding him. I want you to you get that. I'll eat canned tuna all day. I don't care. I'm That's awesome. Be <laughs> Take you it know, one for the team. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just it's yeah, that same it's the right thing to do. No. Yeah, you just got just there's a problem in front of you. How can you find a way to solve it? It's not going to be glorious and elegant. We're not eating bacon every day during the pandemic. Yeah. You know, but it, you know, it's the way it works. And I think so a lot of those lessons do carry over into my private life, which is nice. That's beautiful. And then the same thing with the shooting as well. You know, um, I haven't really been at the range in a, in a, in a while lately. Um, but I know when I was, that was never great. I was pretty good. It was fun. Yeah, well, I mean, ammunition is scarce right now. It feels weird to go. I, I yeah. There's one mentor I see maybe uh, I, I saw him like last month. I'll probably see him again in a month, and we, we do like a tactical shoot. But yeah, uh, it's uh, I don't know. It feels weird because it's like ah, there goes another dollar. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I know it's pretty crazy. Um, yeah. yeah, I feel kind of bad for a lot of you know teenagers and fresh kids out of high school and college today. There's so much pressure on them to feel like they need to be perfect, and they're just I think they're just completely misguided that that's not necessary. Of course, uh, no, I completely yeah, agree because it's unachievable. Yeah, There's no perfect. Perfect yeah. the enemy of good uh, is another exactly. Like. Hundred percent agree with you on that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my wife and I are saying, wow, I think you know, good generation at this point where we can see a lot of the mistakes of the other, you know, other people, and hopefully not apply those, you know, and apply those lessons learned to our own family and yeah. you know, teach our son that you don't have to be perfect. You know, just try to be fun, do the right thing. You know, be honest. You know, just be a good person. You know. I mean, so I think a lot of those things are going to, you know, carry forward into my per my private life, which is going to be nice to just, you know, there's a lot of correlation in my life between engineering and, and my private life. So it's kind of nice. That's awesome. I, I really appreciate and respect that philosophy. I guess I was really, really interested more in that Mars helicopter. That sounds like a fascinating project. And yeah, it was really pretty neat. I mean, I was really, when they first contacted us, we thought it was a joke. Like I remember my, uh, the CEO of Moto AI, when he first came to me and he's like, hey, Vinny, he's like, what do you think about, we call the Eagle internally, that was the, the code name for that <laughs> nice. that they use. I think we had a mongoose at one place I worked. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, what do you think of uh, Eagle being on Mars? And I'm like, what? <laughs> like Mars the planet? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yeah, we have uh, some emails from JPL. He's like, they want to talk to us about the hardware and that. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. Let's find out what they, what they need to do. And it was really kind of cool because they not only just – treated us as a supplier, but they wanted to inform us. They actually came to Qualcomm when they had this amazing presentation on the challenges of operating electronics in space. 
like you know what the you know the radiation hits that the, the circuits can take and how you get like a, a, a event upsets or they call it single event upsets SCUs is the, I think the phrase they use uh, where you can literally get bit flips in memory from because radiation. radiation strike that's interesting yeah exactly and and they wanted to really teach us and on this and help us understand why they chose us and they were saying that basically our chips for the mainstream chips out there were performing the best of everyone else how do you rat harden something like that if I can ask. I think it's enclosures. I mean, the board itself was made for, you know, a lot of the hardware that I design is uh, fundamentally mimics a lot of the commercial mobile space. Makes sense. Um, so even like some of our military customers that we have at Model AI, um, there's a little bit of an onus on them to take this, you know, commercialized mobile style cell phone product and make it rugged. And it's usually in the form of an enclosure is how they would solve that problem. And I would think shock mounts. I mean, there's there's a few things, but an enclosure. Yeah, everything. Sure. Yeah, I, I worked at Raytheon for a little bit after I left Qualcomm. Before I started cool. Moto, I did the whole Texas thing. Um, yeah, yeah, Texas for, is great. I kind of want to move there at some point too. Yeah, we did that for for a year and change and then decided to come back to San Diego. But San I worked Diego at Raytheon. Was awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so I worked at Raytheon for about a year there. And and I saw, I was, I was curious to learn about how do they deal with electronics in a ruggedized military sense. And I quickly saw that all the all the electronic design parameters and constraints, they're identical, really. It's more about the assembly and then the enclosure can make a big difference is, is really the biggest way that they solve that. I mean, sure, there's maybe some product selections that you would do differently. Uh, I'm guessing you go with like high roll components when you can. Yeah, I mean, if you want to put an FPGA on a board, it's going to be an FPGA that Xilinx or Altair or well, I guess now Intel make, and that's going to be it. There's no other real option, so you need to make Intel bought Xilinx. What's that? I feel like I live under a Intel purchased Xilinx. I'm. What was that? You said Xilinx now Intel, so I I was asking. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, uh, Altair now Intel. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, a couple of years ago, it was I guess still Altera. My my apologies. I, no, no uh, worries. I just got excited because it was like a new piece of data. <laughs> no, 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 no. Xilinx is still Xilinx. Um, yeah. um, as far as but anyway, my point was that you know, there's if if your if your problem requires a certain solution that only exists for one market, you need to make it adapt to the other market. Yes, yeah. I guess where I'm going with that. I'm with you. Um, and so I think what was kind of interesting was to see how JPL would take our commercially designed mobile style hardware design and apply it to this space application. And they didn't disclose, disclose too much to us. You know, we were invited on site. We got to see their labs and see how um, see their, their famous um, uh, chamber where they can drop the pressure down to mimic different atmospheric conditions oh, of cool. different planets. Um, they showed us like a mock-up model of the rover. Um, you know, so it's kind of really did just they go cool to scale in order to try to hit the gravity a little bit. Cause I've seen that. They did. So they, their, their flight chamber, they're able to adjust the air pressure for the density of the, out of the atmosphere. And they do a dynamic. They've got a whole flight tra- chamber set up for that. Yeah. This is actually pretty bitching awesome. what they do. Um, they yeah. have a dynamically controlled tether system. Interesting. That will, that will in concert with the air pressure, mimic the gravity. That's so cool. So you got to have like, uh, what's it called? Like um, lift points on your on your structure. Yeah. So they have this really cool system where, so as as the thing was flying around on Earth, they have the air pressure correct and they have the gravity correct. So they're not scaling it down; they're yanking on it no. to, to equal. Yeah, they're doing experience. all different things to make it to mimic it as much as possible. So it's kind of cool to hear how they did that, um, and to see a little bit of it firsthand was kind of cool. That's awesome. Um, and then, yeah, I was, you know, it was one of those things where I never was really interested in those like space launches that they do. Um, for some reason, so I never I, cared. I used to work at SpaceX and I kind of became numb to it, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I just, I just, I guess for some reason, I just wasn't interested in it so much. And then once I found out that, oh, wow, this launch is going to include the, ro- the the helicopter on it, I want to watch this thing. Nice. And then I started watching the launches now and all that kind of cool stuff. And then also with SpaceX well, and, being able to... And that's the thing is like when you get back into it, I mean, you're like, okay, I probably should keep watching this and this is great. Yeah. <laughs> I really liked watching the ones where SpaceX can reland their booster module. I thought that was so freaking bitching, just the technology. Yeah, I, I, was, I was there when they were developing that. So that was that was really, really fun to watch watch happen in real time. So you did you see any of the catastrophes then? <laughs> uh, yeah, a bunch of them, right? So, I mean, the grasshopper blew up, I think, a few times, but... That would have been in Texas. It was their test module. Um, this would have been back in like 2013 when I was there. 
and they were, I mean, I was just an intern. I wasn't like a big deal or anything, but I, I, I mean, I was, I was in there and I could see it at their headquarters. And so they, they were landing and taking off. And I, I think they might've blown up one or two of those, but I could be wrong. I am not, <laughs> like I said, I don't intimately follow it. So yeah, that's, that's a whole other cool branch of engineering where your stuff yeah. can just literally blow up. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty crazy. And then, like, I mean, those those avionics, you know, uh, guys and those uh, guidance, navigation, and controls guys are just so like on another level. I mean, you know, it's 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 really cool stuff. Yeah, it is it is pretty impressive. And, and uh, yeah, just I just love knowing like how complicated some of these things are, and giving credit and respect to those people. That Millions can do that. of components. Yeah, any one mm. one of which could go wrong, and you know, it will jeopardize your mission. If it's the right one, it'll end your mission. The wrong one, I yeah. Think. Yeah, it is pretty crazy how much, uh, you know, you're relying on one thing. Like well, everything so has to be complexity. perfect. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, you know, weight is, is a real motherfucker in that way. And to yeah. escape the Earth's atmosphere, it takes so much power to weight ratio. I mean. So I don't know the real numbers, but I was I was invited to this other presentation um, not too not too long ago. And just don't quote me on the numbers, but and I hope sure. I'm not grossing wrong. But the presentation showed how the overall payload that was delivered to Mars which is the rover and the helicopter, the proportion of that weight relative to the rocket takeoff weight is almost like 1%. <laughs> like, like the payload of the rover and the helicopter was on the order of like a car, like, you know, maybe, you know, a couple of three, four, 5,000 pounds. Wow. But so you have to have like 600,000 pounds of fuel. Yeah. Of which five hundred thousand pounds of that is burned to get out of the Earth's uh, atmosphere. Correct. Or something of you know something of that magnitude. Well, yeah, I, I say correct, but I realize it's we're talking orders of magnitude here. I mean, it's an insane amount of gas it takes to yeah. escape that. And then so yeah, they use about ninety percent of the fuel to leave Earth's atmosphere, about seven or eight percent to get to Mars, and then the last little bit is just to con kind of control that little descent and entry phase or something of that nature. And, and you know, my numbers are probably off. If, if someone if someone from JPL watches, they'd be you know, gouging out the eyeballs. Just... To, uh, there's the trash right there. <laughs> <laughs> but more or less, I mean, just yeah. it's funny. So, and it's funny because you hear, I was starting to follow some of the comments, like yeah. on some, like in some of the news articles or posts, you know, helicopter does this, rover does that. And then you see some of these just complete nonsense comments of people going, what's so big, what's a big deal about this? Why can't we, why didn't we do this long, long time ago? Why can't we just go back and, and get this? And it's just like, they have no concept of what it takes to, actually do some of these kinds of missions and what the amount of money to launch a kilogram of anything into orbit is, yeah. is an astronomical because I mean, it just takes so much human ingenuity and yeah, concert. it is pretty crazy. So like all that checks, stuff was, I mean, there's so much that goes into that. Yeah. And so all that stuff was foreign to me before I was involved in these programs, which is kind of cool. Just, you know, you never know how like you're doing one program and how something can happen where you just get exposed to so much new information and new data. And it's just, it's just really neat and interesting stuff I find. I completely agree. I think that's why I'm in R and D is because I um I'm just a perpetual like I want to learn more. You know, I want to see things I haven't seen before. But yeah, it's my my wife laughed at me the other day. I'm, well, she laughs she laughs at me pretty much most days. <laughs> um, when I told her I remembered what my when I went to high school. I don't know if they do it now. It's probably all virtual, but you know, I got a printed copy of my high school yearbook. Yeah, and you know, if you call, you get everyone's I got photo with your name. <laughs> And you get to put a quote. Actually, here. I think I was too cheap to spend the money. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you get to put a quote near your photo. For the, you know, you have, you know, what is a quote that kind of typifies your time in high school or whatever. And I told my wife the other day, I just remember what mine was. And she, I was like, my quote was, knowledge is power and power is everything. So the more I learn, the closer everything comes to reach. And I thought that's kind of, to me, at that young of an age, I realized that, you know, I want to just keep learning. I think it was kind of interesting and I, and I, you know, I hope that any young folks that listen to this have that desire and urge to just want to keep learning. Cause I think that's, absolutely that's where you can better yourself. And if, well, and if also honestly, society, I mean, if you, if you, yeah. the person that cures cancer is not going to be somebody that said of them, you know, that person didn't give a, give a rat's ass or whatever. Exactly. It's, it's going to be somebody neurotic and anxious. That's always yeah. questioning if they're good enough, always trying to figure out, you know, a missing angle. They're going to be cynical. And, and they're going to be pushing to be better. I mean, that's that's the only way you you push, you know, the envelope of human achievement. I hate to say it. Yeah, ab that. absolutely. And and I get into trouble with my wife all the time that I'm just a naturally born skeptic yeah. with that as well because I like to see the proof of things. I visited so, a Fortune 50 company, and the uh, before I came on site, the client said, uh, "Bring your most cynical engineer." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's refreshing, you know. It's like absolutely, yeah. yes, sir. You know. Yeah, and uh, and it gets me in trouble though because a lot of times my wife will tell me something and I'm like, what? No, and I got to go look it up for myself. And she's like, why don't you just believe me? <laughs> like, you know I'm like, you know what? You're right. I need to just start trusting what you say is true. But I get caught in that thing of I need to see it for myself. Um, you're saying, and, 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 and like, like I mean, I'm the same way. way. Like, like, like if somebody tells me something, I'm like, okay, okay that's interesting. And then if two people tell me that thing, I'm like, okay, there's multiple data sources. Yeah. Confidence has gone up. This is something I should probably pay attention to. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. What's what's uh what's your? I, I don't know um, how often you talk about this on your on your podcast, but what's some of your quick history? Just yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, so like, like, like I said, I, I started doing electronics when I was like seven years old. I think I found a book in my elementary school uh, library. And it was, uh, it was like Halloween and science experiments. And so it was like radio shack, incandescent light bulbs, and simple circuits. And so I started messing with that stuff. Like I got like the alligator clips. I could walk there from my house. And, um, you know, I, I was such an idiot. I bought like the Iowa stereo. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Because that's all you know, right? I mean, you don't have any money as a kid. <laughs> so you're just like, Iowa, great. <laughs> and then, you know, later you're like, oh, that's a horrible stereo. <laughs> what was I thinking? But, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, it was stuff like that. And then I, I would always be trying to kind of invent stuff. So it was in the 90s when I really switched on in that way. Maybe the midnight, like I think Tupac was just getting killed when I was starting to remember this stuff. So it would have been like 96 era. And so um, I remember just sketching up with a pen and pencil, like all sorts of ideas. So, like I had a brother and a sister. And, um, you know, we wanted to send messages back and forth. So we got like a shop back and like a tube. And we did the bank teller thing between our rooms. <laughs> and then my mom you made, one you made your own squirrel tubes. Yeah, exactly. And my mom like didn't want us to have any internet too late. She thought it was going to corrupt. This would have been in the early 2000s a little later. But we, uh, we came up with like an encryption device, like a secondary modem that she didn't know about. And so it was, yeah, it was kind of, and then like, there, there were, so you, were, like, you were a hacker before hackers were cool. I like to think so. Um, I, I used to read Make Magazine as a kid, and then I've like turned down. I probably could have gotten in it if I wanted to enough, but I, I don't know. I kind of. I guess I'm, this is going to sound kind of bad, and I, I apologize to, to all my friends in the maker community, but I feel like. I guess just because I've gotten into engineering as a professional these days, I'm less impressed with the stuff the maker community turns out lately. And I don't mean to disparage it, because I think it's a really useful thing, and it's helpful, and it's a great kind of leverage point for people that want to get into the field and the art and, and for some it's an end point and that's okay too but for me personally at least i think i'm just i'm, I'm so in awe of the stuff that's being done in the private sector you know professionally and you know to some extent financed by the government as well i mean and just when you take you know the smartest people in the world and you give them a pile of money and you're like hey solve this problem that no one's been able to solve before i mean you know it's it's humbled me i mean i'll, I'll say that yeah. you know and so I mean, I built my first robot when I was 12 years old. If you could call it a robot, it was, uh, do you know Beam, what that is? Like biological, economical, aesthetic, mechanical. Oh, never so heard of that. It's like, it, it's a philosophy. It was this guy, Mark Tilden from Canada. And it was like taking apart old VCRs and like repurposing the motors and, and building simple circuits where, you know, if your switch on this side hits something, it'll reverse or it'll switch a relay. It's crossed over double pull, double throw, and it'll reverse the opposite motor. No, sorry, the same motor. And you'll back away from that obstacle and you get these interesting behaviors, but it's not really a robot because you know it doesn't have the potential to think or retain information. It's or... kind of like the precursor to a, uh, an iRobot Roomba. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it acts like a Roomba. That's exactly it. And you can even put <laughs> in delays funny. with like capacitors, you know, and, and resistive circuits and so. 555 timers are popular in that world and there's yeah a bunch of i remember my uh my my final project at the engineering class i mentioned where you had a, where you had a variety of different uh, engineering disciplines yeah my final project was so i chose to do a drawbridge nice and it failed miserably but the, <laughs> the light awesome. sequence for you know the green to yellow to red i didn't know enough at the time yet and so i got gone to radio shack and bought 555 timer chips and nice and had a track or, and so at least that part worked. <laughs> I, I mean, I, that's I, I, I respect someone that could. I mean, you, these days nobody does it anymore because micro control yeah. is prevalent. But like, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm one of those hipster douches that kind of misses that era a little bit. Yeah, and I think going back to that makerspace comment, I I, I want to kind of uh, 
you know, confirm what you're saying and from my own personal observations as well. Sure. One at, at Qualcomm that had the opportunity to be our project helped fund a lot. There was actually a makerspace that Qualcomm funded. Nice. And they used a lot of the material from our project. And I see what you're saying in that it was all asked the engineers for their free time to help contribute. Yeah. And if you were like me, where is free time coming from? The, the little free time I have, I need to get my butt. Yeah, I need to get my butt to the gym or hiking or biking or something, or I'm going to become a freaking blimp. Spend so time like, with your kid. <laughs> now, even worse. Yeah, yeah. Well, not worse, but in a good way. Yeah, yeah I got gotcha. you. I mean, more demanding. Time management is worse now, yeah. is what I'm saying. Um, so, so I get where, you know, it's tough to try to, you know, get – I like – I like the whole idea of getting young kids into it as well. I'm, I'm a big promoter of that. So I'd I, love to teach. I mentored an old girl, uh, old girl's high school robotics team for a little bit. That was really fun. I, I read a robotics curriculum for high school kids a while ago. That was a good yeah. time. It was rewarding. Um, I mean, yeah, it's same. I mean, these days I, I really get off. Like, I think like you do and just, you know, young engineers, people that are entering, you know, their professional careers, but you know, they still haven't, you know, there's, there's a lot you could teach them if they want to hear it. If they don't, you know, it's like, yeah, exactly. Trying to force it yeah. What's really cool is that in, even like a lot of the folks at Moto AI, my new company now, um, our CTO is, uh, Donald Hudson. He's a BattleBots guy. Oh, cool. And I love BattleBots. I, I build a bunch of 30 yeah. and 15 pounders and no, 30 and 12 pounders, but yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a team lockjaw. Um, That's cool. And so, and so he was, uh, That's like the old BattleBots. Battle the old BattleBots, he was Dissector, and he was a two-time winner. I with remember that. Dissector and from my childhood. That's awesome. He he had a Happy Meal toy after his. I mean, come on, That's you cool. know you've hit, you know, engineering excellence if McDonald's has given you a Happy Meal toy after your pro your creation. I mean, anyway, so I, I I love working with Donald a lot because when I was when I first met him in Qualcomm, he was such a huge advocate and proponent for first robotics and all these other like STEM. Initiative tech I was actually things. picked off the first team two years in a row. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he would go spend, he would volunteer and help you know, high school kids. And he got some of the other members of our group in Qualcomm to go volunteer time and effort and knowledge. And I think that was just awesome and huge. Absolutely. Um, to do that. And I'm totally, I, I'm always willing to be the first person. If someone asks the question, I'll, I'm like, can I answer it? Can I answer? Like, I'm always willing to like, you know, to get on there and just help explain things. That's beautiful. Um, I was telling my wife, I, I'm, I kind of feel bad for my son because if we ever do a long car trip, road trip, his ears are going to be bleeding. By the time <laughs> but like, I mean, I could even put my start to like, I, I mentioned that book, but I did have a mentor. It was my friend's dad who was an audio engineer. Oh, uh, yeah, he yeah. recorded Biggie Smalls and Smashing Pumpkins and, and Yo-Yo nice. Ma was in a family portrait. It was like a music dynasty family. And um, this guy in his attic had like a whole workshop set up and... Um, he was building a robot to pull CDs. So his company was Digital Dynamics Audio Incorporated. I think they're defunct. They might still be alive. Sorry, Francisco, if you're still alive and I said you were defunct. But um, <laughs> anyway, what it was, was um, they would have tons of CD burners in like, like the mid to late 90s. And um, he would pull off like 10 CDs, put them in a stack. There was this guy, Juan, whose whole job it was, was to yank a CD that hadn't been printed yet, put it in a CD label printer, and then put it in the trash. And Francisco's joke was, I already pay Juan way too much to do a half ass job. Why would I pay him more to do a quarter ass job? You know, he's like, <laughs> he was like, like very Spanish, you know, and like the dude, um, he, um, yeah, I don't want to do the accent too hard because I felt like I'm going to get canceled. But like, I mean, we, you know, it's the 90s, you know, they all made fun I of each other. I can imagine, I'm pretty sure your listeners can imagine. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, uh, Francisco's great. I mean, and so like this guy, um, you know, he um, he taught me about transistor transistor logic, relay logic before that, uh, simple circuitry. You know, um, he taught me something wrong, which stuck with me until like this year, which was that ESD wrist straps were for bitches, which a lot of stuff's been destroyed because you're not wearing an ESD wrist strap. I just <laughs> bought a whole bunch of them. <laughs> so it took three, you know, like senior engineers to tell me, dude, you're an idiot. <laughs> Get that wrist strap on. But, you know, other than that, um, you know, I, um, you know, I, I really have a lot of respect and, and gratitude to the guy because he got me passionate at a very young age and took the time to, you know, to teach me things, to give me projects, to give me feedback on my work. Um, you know, me and his son were building all kinds of stuff and it was really a rivalry. We were trying to outdo each other. So like I made like a, a alarm system for a locker. He'd make a better version than That's I'd cool. make a better version. 
and, and it was it was kind of like uh yeah it was just a rivalry where we, we you know interested. i mean competition drives further innovation right absolutely I mean, it's just to, I mean it's definitely it's true i mean you want to be known or just have that confidence and pride that you did something better than someone else i mean it's <laughs> yeah. not a bad thing as long as it's for the benefit of society you know yeah. obviously you don't want to be seen who can go rob the most houses each night but you know, <laughs> <laughs> but if it's for the positive benefit of society yeah competition is very good i i, I totally agree with you yeah. um what's funny yeah, I, was who can say, rob I, the most I, houses. I feel like you know if you were really smart about it you might come up with some interesting stuff that could be applied elsewhere that's definitely a challenge and problem I don't want to think about. No, me neither, but I mean, I'm just sorry. I'm, you know, I'm, yeah. With the exception of applying it to my own house. Okay, how can I think like a well, criminal? Well, so same, actually, to be honest. So I, I yeah, as a kid, so... I was really into security systems, and now I've got a really bitchin' security camera system that covers a lot of different angles, and even, yeah. like, you have cameras pointing at the wiring because you know it's a failure point if somebody knew what they were doing. Yeah. So. And so, yeah, so I know when I tell my wife, I whenever I put up a camera or something, I always tell her, okay, you know, if someone were to cut out the power or come at the very least, we'll get them for, you know, it's like, I always try to think of what would they do to try to bypass battery it, backups on everything. I mean, yeah, yeah. And that's interesting. I, yeah, I guess I don't want to get into your security system, but I'd be kind of curious, like what some of the things are that you've learned about redundancy there, just because it's such a fascinating world to me. For me, I figured out it's one of those things where, um, you, you can't protect against everything. Of course. So what I, what I try to do is just protect against the stupid, obvious, simple things that are going to be the 95% plus scenario Same. where it's going to be some kid that's just trying to like be tough with his friends or someone that's drunk or someone that's maybe unfortunately maybe has a mental condition that just yeah. lost their way that as I, long I, as you just, oh, sorry, yeah, if you just say, I, lock some things, no. yeah, if you just have the basic camera set up and basic locks and make sure that you're just consistent in your basic security, you're going to prevent, you know, the 95% plus cases. Like I tell my wife, when it comes to my guns, I have, I have two safes. Yeah. I have, I have a safe for the invited guests and, and, and that's basically a small, quick, cheap safe. That's quick access for, you know, bedside type thing. Yeah. Where I said, okay, it's, it's, it'll protect against those that know us and respect us. They're not going to try to break into the thing. It keeps the kids away. It keeps our guests away. It keeps the pets away. Yep. However, of course, there's always a scenario where maybe you're a targeted person, right? If someone knows what you have and is intent on targeting you specifically and wants what you have, yeah. there's really going to be like, you need like a 10 X increase in technology to prevent that. Yeah. And, and it's almost not worth it. Like, we're, okay, I'm not going to have all these extra backup electronic you know, servers and cameras. And it's it's so unlikely that if it does happen, let's just hope I'm not home. Yeah, of course. And then we submit an insurance claim. Yeah, that's right? the way to do and it. If I am home, then I'll do the best thing I can do to save the guy's life after I shoot him. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, so I, so I always say, and, and so I have the safe for the uninvited guest, which would take like, a significant effort in Omaha to get into. But if that's the case, then someone was targeting me and there's pretty much not else I can do to prevent that if someone's targeting you. So I think for the, for the 1% case where that's unlikely to happen, I try not to freak out about it and just do some basic stuff, which will get you most of the time there. Most of the crime that you hear in your neighborhood is because someone left their purse in the car. Someone left their car doors unlocked. Yeah. Someone left their door unlocked. I had a battery die door. on on my car, uh, like clicker thing, and I, I got broken into one time. You know, yeah, I'm just like, it, it's All right, just this... well, that's what happens to yeah. me now. <laughs> now exactly. I've got, now that parking spot is two security cameras covering it. <laughs> so, yeah. what's funny was if you're calling the beginning, I was mentioning how I did the car stereo installation. So I always I had a Jeep when I was uh, going to college out in Long Island, and I just loved keeping the top down, doors off. It was just you know it was great. I just enjoy the the most of it. Yeah, and. I can't tell you how many times I used to get the radius with the detachable face. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I've, and, I've used and so I can't tell, I think it was at least three times where might've had a drink or two that I shouldn't have. Yeah. And I left the face on the radio. No doors, no top. All right. Ah, crap. So, so I go up next morning and guess what? My radio is gone. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Right. My dad but, was in Manhattan uh, in like the seventies. I think he got like five stolen in like a month one time. Yeah, I think I did. It, I think I did it twice in like the same year or the same summer once, and I was like, "Oh man, I gotta stop doing that." And then so I started uh, just being really careful about it, and most of it was my own fault. And one time I left my cell phone in my Jeep because my company at the time I went to, 
they didn't want phones and you couldn't have your cell phone in the building. Um, and so I left my cell phone out and then I went a bunch of us went to like a lunch remotely and I left my vehicle there. So I was with someone else. And so sure enough, I come back from lunch and my cell phone's gone. It's like, cause it was right there. God damn it. You know, Jeep with, you know, I don't, I, whenever I have a Jeep, I don't bother locking the doors cause they can just easily get right into it. So there's no point. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, and so I just thought that was kind of, you know, most of the things I have bad happen is because it's my fault or someone else's fault. And you know, well, it's wife, better to have an open door and be missing a thing than to have a broken, you know, whatever that they cut through. You know? Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the soft tops are like six, seven, eight hundred bucks now. Yeah. Um, so I always tell my wife, I'm like, you know, the, the level of security we have is going to prevent the 18 year old little punk in the neighborhood. That's just trying to get, you know, prove his friend something, but you know, so I, I just, and so to your viewers there, you know, I don't stress too much about um, being the best and the greatest and the most technological competent because your, your 95% use case or scenario for protecting it is against the, the stupid stuff. I mean, there's a lot to be said for that, I think, too. And like my, my dad uh, was a surgeon uh, orthopedics. And one of the things he was telling me is the young guys, you know, that just get started out of residency will, um, you know, try to be really fancy and do all this extra stuff and, you know, like just add stitches that don't. I'm just making stuff up because I don't really understand surgery, but they'll like add extra stitches that don't need to be there and, and do all this extra yeah. crap and, you know, again, send hate mail, you know. To, uh, <laughs> anyway. Yeah, and, and it's good. Yeah, and it's good. But, for... but apparently the old guys, they just chill out. They focus on the 95%, you know, that matters yeah. and, and they have better outcomes. And so it, it's going back to that perfect is the enemy of good, right? I mean, if, if you want to try and design the perfect system, you, you're never going to get there someone will always find a new, a new hole into it. And so I just try to, in a lot of things in my life, I just try to get good enough. You know, does this, you know, am I giving my family enough time in my day? Am I doing enough, good enough job at work? Am I doing a good enough job with my health? Am I trying to be social enough with my friends? I mean, it's never going to be perfect on all fronts. So you just do the best you can. I think that applies equally about that, you know, the whole work-life balance mantra that some companies have. I think it's, it's, it's legit to, to just do that and, and follow it with a lot of things. I mean, if you're just cognizant of your, everything that you do, then bad things probably won't happen. Yeah. Like pay attention to the traffic light before you actually cross, even though you just got a green and if it was a highway, you still look anyway before you go. Yeah. Um, uh, just, you know, silly things that, you know, you just, if you develop it as a routine, I think a lot of the bad things will never happen to you. Like I've been really fortunate in my life, my family that we never really had a lot of bad things happen to us. And, and awesome. I think it's just because of those basic observations and, and willingness to just pay attention to your surroundings respect other people, respect your surroundings. I was actually telling my wife the other day how I was jumped when I was in uh, middle school with my buddy. We were walking home from his girlfriend's house on, on Staten Island at like two in the morning. And, here, and my wife's like, wait a minute, how old are you? I was like, I don't know, maybe 13. And she's like, and you're out walking at two in the morning? And I'm like, Staten Island. <laughs> it was the 90s. It was, the it, was, it was fine. It was no big deal. Yeah. yeah we, didn't see the, we haven't seen the good, we didn't see the good fellas yet. So we didn't know how bad. <laughs> I had some shit go down the six train where I started to tell my parents the story. And they're like, I don't want to hear the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was telling my wife how I was, you know, I, that's when I had just happened to start carrying a little tiny pocket knife with me for some reason. I just started carrying a little pocket knife. Yeah. And me and my buddy Chuck, we were walking down uh, one of the roads, and a car pulled up, and they started to they asked us for our coats. It was the first time. It was like in flight jackets were really popular. He had a starter jacket, so we had two of us both had very popular, nice jackets. Yeah. And they wanted the jackets, and I, I told my wife, and and so I remember reaching into my pocket and grabbing that little tiny pocket knife, and I had to make a conscious decision. Yeah. Do I just let it go, or do I try to fight back? And one of these kids, two of them, I think, had baseball bats, and there's four of them. And there's oh, two Jesus. of us. And I'm like, do I try to make a stand with my little tiny pocket knife outnumbered against these guys, or do I just accept it and let it go? And they've got a reach and, advantage with a baseball bat, so you're probably gonna get beat the fuck up. And and I swear, I think that was like the, that little tiny simple decision could have changed the direction of my entire life. Where if I mean, I had a gun moment, in my face in Central Park, and I remember thinking like, oh boy. you know, am I gonna, you know, like I'm proud, I'm I'm a egotistical motherfucker, but like. This is not the time for that. <laughs> you got to, you got to know when to swallow your part. That's actually, you, if you don't mind, can can I hear that story? I mean, if you don't want to bring it up, yeah, I no, 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 no. Happy to talk about it. So I, I had, I had just gotten back from my first international travel. I was feeling great. I, um, buddy of mine who I knew from grad school, or he was in grad school as an undergrad, uh, his flight attendant. He was spoke like five languages, and so he said, you know, do you want to fly to another country? And I was like, sure. He goes. How about, you know, Costa Rica? I'm like, that sounds like fun. So he flew me to Houston, you know, we're going to go 
He's like, you ready to go to Brazil? I'm like, sure. That's the same bag I would have packed for Costa Rica. So, you know, I got to the airport. Um, the guy goes, where's your passport? I said, uh, passport? What are you talking about? Um, oh, yeah, passport. Here you go. And he goes, um, where's your visa? I'm like, visa? Uh, you know, you need a visa to go to Brazil? And he goes, well, I didn't know that either. So I'm like, oh, crap. So I said, what do we do now? And he goes, well, let's look at the departure board. We're looking at it. We're looking. We go, um, all right, well. We start arguing, right? Baggage handler over here is just arguing. He goes, you know, there's five open seats on the flight to London. I'm like, London? London. So we end up in London. I'm wearing shorts and a fucking football jersey. <laughs> and uh, in the dead of winter, it's December. And so, um, you know, this is my first trip. And I just remember coming out of it with a sense of, you know, we're all very much alike. And I won't bore you with all the details of that vacation. But I just remember being really at peace with myself and, and having this, you know, citizen of the world kind of mentality and just feeling really good about humanity. And, and so I, I went to New York because, you know, my buddy was based on a Newark and, you know, I wanted to lay over. I had some friends in Manhattan and Brooklyn. And so um, we, we went to a Central Park and we're hanging out and we're going to eat some cannoli at like midnight in the park. And these two guys walk by us and didn't think anything of it. You know, we're just walking around there, walking around, whatever. And then I heard the slide clock, <laughs> slide, slide, slide oh. cock. Uh, it was a Glock. And so that's that's where the association came from. And um, I just remember staring at the barrel, trying to figure out if it was a real gun or not. Because, you know, I figured this is New York. I mean, this is super illegal. The guy might have a BB gun. Uh, people get stuck out with BB guns all the time. You know, but I, I grew up with BB guns and, you know, the caliber was way bigger than that of a BB gun and it looked like a nine millimeter. And I, you know, I, I did all but crap my pants. I mean, really what it was, was yeah, um, I put my hands up. My pride wouldn't let me say anything, but my sensibility wouldn't let me, you know, not, you know, like I didn't want to say anything that would get me shot or stabbed by, there were two guys, there was one pointing the gun at us and then there was the other guy that expert, this was not his first rodeo. He patted us down like he knew what he was doing. He oh, went wow. through our pockets. Um, first, they asked for wallet and cell phone. And because I had frozen up, because I was overly proud, my ego was getting in the way, I um, I just stood there. And, and the guys took my briefcase, which wasn't worth anything to them. I mean, they later found it, you know, in a bush somewhere. Um, but, you know, to replace it was was a whole bunch of money. Um, and then yeah, my the logistics of similar. That. Yeah, exactly. My car keys, three hundred dollars in the airport parking lot. I couldn't fly home anymore, uh, even though my friend had already gotten me a flight ticket. So I had to take a bus. I had to borrow like four hundred dollars cash from another friend. You know, oh, so dude. yeah, it was it was a big pain in the rear. And these guys, their their haul was probably maybe like a hundred bucks, because they had a cell phone they could sell in the black market or the gray market, and then they had, you know, eighty bucks out of my pocket. Maybe, maybe like two hundred bucks they made, but like my my expense was like close to like fourteen hundred. So. Yeah. You know, it was uh, well, the lesson learned is next time that happens, just give them your cash, you know, and, and maybe your cell phone if they ask for it and swallow your. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you can you can Monday morning quarterback it all the time. Like in the moment of panic, you just freeze up. That is when I started yeah. buying guns was after that happened. <laughs> I will say that. But, you know, just make sure you good in that training. I mean, well, also, not, the other not, thing not, is these guys had the drop on us, even if I had had it. I mean, the guy patted us down. Now all I need is him to have my pistol, you know, and like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, not not to be preaching, but yeah, just make sure you do a lot of training, because um, I think no matter what, and I keep telling my wife this all the time, I, I hope that if the time ever came, I would be as confident as I think I am when I'm on the range, and you're not going to be. That's just the, the truth of it. Yeah. And you just gotta hope that your instincts kick in the right way, and uh, yeah, and don't be a hero. Just. I always, you know, important Much thing better is to, to run away than to, than to get a gunfight every time. Yeah. And uh, when we moved back from Texas to San Diego last year before COVID hit, um, our U-Haul was broken into in Tucson. And I was really freaking out because I had had my pistols in that Oh, trip, no. Along with all of our wine. <laughs> Did you lose anything? Or no? There we go. And thankfully, they filled up on the back end of the truck. But what had happened was I was so nervous and I was so worried. And you know, when I called 911, I said, I don't know if they got to any of my guns yet. I'll tell you, cops got there right away, by the way, if you do that. Nice. <laughs> uh, I thought it was broken in you. Well, they'll show up three weeks later. Um, yeah. But if you mention that there's weapons in there, they'll Johnny on the spot. Yeah, cops showed up in like 20 minutes. That's the fastest uh, response. Thankfully, they didn't. But 
I think it was important as, as an adult to have that mentality of, you know, it was like, okay, it's just stuff. You know, we weren't there. I, my wife was saying, oh, I wonder if you would have walked. I was like, you know, honestly, I don't know if I would have wanted to walk out on that. Yeah. But no, it's that. like the worst case, because they didn't get any of our guns and thankfully none of our wine. Yeah. Um, my whiskey was in still at the house for the other trip I was going to do. So then definitely didn't get that. Nice. Um, I was like, you know, it's just stuff. You know, it, it's hard to get to that point of, of maturity to recognize that. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, it's one of those things. A bunch of guys with baseball bats roll up on you will make you realize that pretty quick. I know. Well, I was I was too young. I yeah, mean, I, I kind of want to hear this story, by the way. Like, I mean, I, I told you. Oh, so, yeah. Before. So just to finish it up. Yeah. I mean, I, seventh grade, I think I was. Wow. And uh, yeah, because it was middle school, so it was either uh, New York was a uh, six, seven, eight is middle school, so it was one of those two, one of those three years. And uh, I just made the decision to just give because all they did was ask for the jackets, like they didn't ask for wallet because we were too young. We probably we didn't have wallets. I didn't have a wallet. I had maybe yeah. like five bucks on me. You know, if we if we had wallets, we would have taken the bus. You know, we were we were walking at two in the morning along this the street. Yeah. For like an it was like an hour walk for us, and here we are, you know, seven year olds walking, and I think we just looked at each other and just said, "Here, take them." And they took the jackets and they left. And we were like, WTF, like what the hell just, just happened there? And it's like, it's like, well, that was brutal. And I, the whole time I'm just clenching my pocket knife in my hand, but I, I kept the blade in, like I never unfolded the blade. Yeah. And then looking back, I'm like, you know, I'm so glad I never tried to be the hero. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's good that you had it just in case, but yeah. like the same time, exactly. I don't want to use that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for my ninety-five dollar flight jacket, compared to potentially getting a baseball bat to the head, yeah, or something. I mean, I could have, you know, been You're stabbing paralyzed a guy, something. and you know, you ended up in juvie for like God knows how long. And yeah, like, it's and it's like you know, I, I really think that was just the right decision. I mean, I've been fortunate where agreed. It just you just the fact you had the maturity at that age to realize that though is pretty pretty incredible. I mean, yeah, the restraint is tough. I mean, having restraint is is tough. It's you know. <laughs> I hate you know I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a movie quote guy at, at times no, the same, I always, yeah. and I oftentimes whenever I start talking to somebody about firearms or or any kind of weapon ownership I love that quote from Spider Man um, where Uncle Ben tells him with great power comes great responsibility and and it's so true and so true especially with any kind of firearms or self defense mechanism even just if you you know fans of Cobra Kai just the knowledge of being able to know how to fight that that that's power that you need to harness with the right set of responsibility and, yeah and it's, no, i completely so it's just, agree i mean you don't want to be that guy pulling out a gun because of a parking space or like yeah really anything except a direct threat on your life like i mean yeah and so i'm glad that a lot of the training i've taken has really instilled that you know I, i've got a lot of my you know concealed carry permits for multi-states all across the united states except california funny enough did you go to utah um, or I, I have utah i got florida i got arizona i had texas when i was there so it's um, now that I'm back in California, it's just those. Um, I haven't done that. Although I hear San Diego is now accommodating of it. I just haven't done it yet. Well, that's um, fair I'm, I'm sure, sure it's kind of a pain. In Pittsburgh, it's easier than voting. So. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, which, I it's, it's one of those things. Where, yeah, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. And it's one of those things where I tell guys at work that, like, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of young guys, a lot of interns, and they're like, oh, I heard you like to shoot. You know, I'm like, sure, sure, sure. I'm like, but you need to understand something. I'm going to really preach to you a little bit about safety and you know if i see you doing anything unsafe or silly i'm gonna take it away from you, you know, i'm just you know i really my dad taught me very early that you know this is a, a huge responsibility to to take and, and and i hope that you know anyone that i engage with in, in that sport or those effects kind of take that same thing from me that you know they need to recognize it's a, it's a pretty big deal it's a pretty big responsibility i couldn't agree and more it's not just around hey absolutely no 100 percent so you know, it was actually it's funny. My uh, my buddy and I we were hiking this morning, and we were just talking about a whole bunch of different stuff that we brought up as well today. And we had just brought up about the um, you know some of the military movies that we just recently that were. I'm like, oh man, that American Sniper and uh, Long Lone Survivor. Saw, we were yeah. just talking about those movies. Nice. Just so uh, got like in, now, Ed, when you mentioned military movies, sitting by Ryan. Yeah. So a lot of the uh, it's so funny how. Like I said, my, my exposure because of COVID, I haven't really been out much. With you know, the only exposure I get to the young generation is through work. Did you get vaccinated? And all, these, you know, young, all these young twenty-year-olds, and I and there was a comment the other day. I forget what it was exactly, but I said, "Oh, like right of the Valkyries," and then, and the kid looked at me like this, <laughs> and I'm like, 
You've never, never heard, heard of Flight of the Valkyries? We're only 19 years old. <laughs> like, but that's like, like that's classic. classic. Like, you know, like, I'm like, I'm like, okay. I'm like, go watch Apocalypse Now. And you'll get it. <laughs> Every single, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, it's 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 the funniest thing too to like you know, the parody, right? But like, I'm sure you've done that with drone flights. Like, I would be more surprised if you hadn't. Mm -hmm. And some internal video. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I know Donald Hudson. I think he did something like that. Um, they were we were talking about putting speakers on on ours, uh, on one of them one day, and just kind of playing around. And then we were also thinking about one day just. Because I think it's illegal, so I don't know if it's really we would do it. But talk about you know, let's go out to the desert and see if we can strap any of your pistols to this thing. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know about that. Just because we could doesn't mean we should. <laughs> well, I don't mean also like I would think the recoil would not you out the sky. Well, then you probably can't have modern controls. Even still, yeah, just because you could, you should. We have uh, one of the guys. In our, uh, it's funny. One of the guys in our company is a brilliant PhD guy from UCSD. Um, he was one of the creators of he, his technology at UCSD is what created that me robot, the, the, the self-balancing little toy robot. Oh, cool. Um, he, he hit him. He was one of the key guys that created that inverted pendulum technology, like a Segway, but for toys. Was that the one that uh, Ologic worked on, I think, or is that a different I don't, one? I don't remember. You know, I just know it. I know there was a version that became the, the me, I think, MII or MI. It was like a little two wheel, tiny little robot that would wheel around. But anyway, he works for us now at Moto AI. That's cool. And he's into guns as well. We were talking about how, like, he's the kind of guy that would be able to figure that out. Like, it's just so yeah. cool, like, to, you know, to, to, you know, like I said, I don't know everything, but just to know some people that know a lot of other cool stuff, like, it would just be such a cool conversation with him to talk about, okay, how would you handle a recoil on a firearm mounted to a drone? Yeah. And he would, be, he would just like, oh, he's like, you could do it. Yeah, just to see, you can tell when someone's brain starts working. Yeah, yeah, of course. It would be a fun kind of conversation to have. No, I completely agree, and it's I, I love those guys too that'll just come up with loopholes or like things you wouldn't have thought of, or like I mean this this goes back to university, but when I was at school, I remember there was um the stair climbing robot contest, and there was one guy in the class that just he was it was kind of lateral thing. He would always cover his thing with a, a sheet or whatever, and he unveiled the sheet, and it was a blimp. <laughs> it just had a twang. <laughs> it dangled down and touched all the stairs. <laughs> It's like if you don't have to touch the stairs, why do it, right? We touched them, but I mean, it wasn't climbing them. <laughs> it's like, boop, boop, boop. So and you then, know, it's funny. I want to give I want to give a shout out to your buddy there, Andrew, who hooked us up because yeah, I yeah. worked with him for a few months at Raytheon. That's cool. And yeah, Andrew, I, I, great guy. Yeah, I, I just have no I've idea always, what his socials are, but I would plug him if I knew him. <laughs> I, I know. I just it's it's one of the things where I refer to him a lot as he was a fresh grad with just a ton of energy, and. When I was with him at Raytheon, I kept telling him, Andrew, you're in the wrong place for your level of creativity um, because he was just such an out of the box thinker. And I'm like, Andrew, please promise me you will never lose that uh, desire to think and create yeah. if someone keeps telling you this isn't going to work. Because it, that, like, I'm glad he left Raytheon. Um, because I've worked for companies like that too, where it's just it so... would have just squashed his creativity. Yeah, yeah, it's it, so it just would have. Yeah, and 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 so any brother listeners out there that you know that deal with that, I encourage them. You know, just stay creative, stay stay focused on doing some cool shit, even if the people you're around don't want you to do it. I think it's kind of. <laughs> You know, because as an engineer, you can do cool shit. I mean, when I was at Joy Mining, my, my swearing was a major point of contention. My my drinking at lunch was a point of contention. So I would have a, I would have one beer at lunch. And that was like, we don't like to be the kind of house. Like, I know we all do it. They were so non-confrontational. Yeah. So we're all doing it. But, you know, and, I'm like, <laughs> and then there was another guy, Lucas, who was, it was great because he was honest. And he was like, they're talking about you, Spencer. That's about you. <laughs> and then another thing I do is when I code, I like to put my feet up on the desk and lounge a little bit. And so, you know, because you're there for, you know, like 14 hours. Yeah, you right? got an program. Yeah, exactly. And so physical comfort is helpful. And so that was another thing they just didn't like the optics of. And and so, you know, it was, it was so, a point of contention. I'll never forget my first boss at SMSC. I guess they're now microchip. I owe him so much credit for helping me to appreciate and and deal with work in a lot of different ways. We used to, we were such a tight knit group when I first worked there. And my college buddies, I got a bunch of them to work there with me. And we used to just go to the strip club at lunchtime. Cool. And then have a drink, have food, whatever, and then go back to work. That's awesome. And then it was just it was just so much like it just didn't matter. Just when you're when you're at work, it, you know, I, I got this quote from him. You know, when like playing poker, if you know, 
when when your cards are in your hands and you got to play your hand, you play your hand. But when you're out of the game, you're out of the game. And he kind of said that's like a work parallel where if you know if you got work to get done, you better get your freaking work done. Yeah. He's like, but if we're celebrating something, you know, taped out or something was brought up successfully or we hit a milestone, he's like, it's cool to just chill for a day and relax and catch your breath and regroup and and, and focus again yeah, for the next the moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I just, I love that, you know, he was just so like, you know, balanced with, you know, you better work your ass off, but at the same time, I'm going to reward you for doing a good job and we'll go have some fun too. Yeah. I like that a lot. There was an ad agency I used to work at called deep local here in Pittsburgh and their whole shtick was they would do um, like elaborate publicity stunts. So like um, when I was there, we did the self vibration machine for old Navy and it was a, <laughs> a balloon matrix and the balloons would inflate. I think there was two miles of cabling in it and the balloons would inflate. Oh, wow. uh, there was accumulators in each balloon and then they would use timing to, to set the level of inflation, one of four values. And so you'd take a selfie and then it would um, rosterize it and then render it in balloons on a billboard. And That's I think, crazy. I think they took it to LA and then Manhattan uh, to debut and they might have done a tour, I don't remember. But it was it was like an old navy concert. It was pretty fun, and then I, I think we salvaged the tech from an H and R Block project that got scrapped. And then uh, there was another one that was uh, the Adidas. They really like selfies, so it was like the Adidas shoe selfie. And then there was a there was a spray can for Google, so they started doing like uh, expos, and Google was like a big client for them. So they had this uh, Viacom Vision system that would track infrared markers on these spray cans and you'd shake it. It had an IMU inertial measurement unit for our listeners in there. And, um, you know, it made like a <laughs> kind of sound, you know, with the speaker in there and then you'd spray and the Viacon system would track where it was at. Um, and then there's a button on top and, um, it was kind of cool. So we had three by three monitors and, and you could tag up the monitors and then, you know, you just hit like an erase button and then the next person got to go. And so it was, it was kind of fun. Uh, so we did stuff like that. And I remember every Friday, um, the secretary, Amy, who I'm still friends with, she's a, she's a cool person. Um, she would, um, email you and say, Hey, uh, today we're doing mimosas and, uh, Manhattans. What do you want at your desk at 3 PM? And you know, they, nice. they just bring it to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I just, I love that, you know, when you have the creativity and, and, and motivation to mix your professional life with fun stuff. I remember when I was uh, in college, I think I was at my senior year. So many of the guys, they were doing uh, potato gun competitions and they would make, for anyone that's know what a potato gun is, it's basically a big tube of compressed air. If you ever seen that thing on uh, uh, Discovery Channel where they do the pumpkin chunking contest yeah, every year, chunkin'. where, they, where they have the pneumatic based ones that try to just blow it out with compressed Dude, air. Rednecks are ingenious. Like, I, I love yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah again, improvise, adapt, overcome, right? Just yeah. that's where you see all the crazy You see like hookiness. trebuchets, you see people that hook up engines and they've got two pumpkins and they have a release mechanism once they get it spinning to use yeah. the centrifugal force. I mean, Always love watching that show just because it's just so cool and so creative and so clever to see what that is. And it's just, it's always interesting to see what other people think of and how like, oh, I would have done it that way or I would have done it exactly that way. Or it's just kind of cool like I to see agree. that. I mean, that was the fun of Battle Bots is I had a really yeah. bad breakup. And I remember I, um, I, I basically like ghosted after like a really intense, you know, kind of thing. And um, my escape was that I spent, you know, I think like 1,200 hours in the shop machining parts for Battle Bot that promptly got destroyed. Oh, wow. And so you know, it was, it was therapeutic, but I mean, that was, you know, that was it. I mean, I just directed all my focus to this thing and, uh, you know, it was healing. You know? Yeah. It's crazy. I remember when I was, um, before I got married and, uh, when I was still at Qualcomm, I tried doing like a little, uh, LLC of my own, cause I was always getting phone calls from my former friends or, uh, some, you know, just friends in, in my community that I knew were like, Oh, how, can I, can you make something for me? Can you do that for me? Or, and I was like, you know, if I'm going to start making stuff for people, I better at least get a tax write off for it. You know, yeah, I don't need to make money on it, but at least then they get the tax write off. Yeah. So I did form an LLC some time ago and, uh, you still I was trying it? to like put all my free, I, I disbanded it when I went to Raytheon, um, because they're really, they were pretty hard about conflicts of interest and, alternate employment uh, mechanisms and, and they wanted to know everything and i just figured you know i'm not gonna have time for it you, know, it's I like just one of those sheets you get like appendix a where you have to list everything else you're into and they just want to know line by line oh yeah it was, it was a pretty detailed application yeah. um and then 
And that was even after you got accepted for a job, you know, it just is. all this conflict yeah, of this. interest. And, yeah. Um, and so I wanted to make sure I just disclosed. So I wanted to close it. Before. And plus, I was never making any money. I was just losing money on it every year. But it was one of those oh, things where I kind of like you had said, you would, you know, used to just write down all your ideas when you were younger. It was kind of like more in my early 30s. I would write down all these ideas and I would try to implement them and think that they were kind of cool things. That I, would, I picked up almost every eval kit you can imagine from SD Micro, Silicon Labs, TI, you know, Freescale. I had like I had every single version of things that you can imagine. Like Beagle Bones. I just everything nice. that you could think of. For, for for tinkering and playing, gave one of those away. <laughs> and and I would always start something, and like I would start doing a schematic. I would actually start doing a design. I would start figuring it out, and then something would happen. Whether it was like a work trip I had to go to, like if I had to go to China, or if I had to like you know the project all suddenly amped up, and I was now working seventy eight hours a week, um, and nothing ever got finished. <laughs> And I just had to accept the fact that, okay, you know what? Maybe these little hobbyist projects just aren't for me. <laughs> yeah, well, I that's it. I mean, I, sorry, I shouldn't say that's it. For me, that's also it. Yeah. Again, it's like, no disrespect like, to hobbyists. I mean, because. No, I love yeah, it. And, and it's yeah, funny because I, I don't know how job. they do it. I don't I don't know how they do it. Like Mike Donald and, and my friends at Momo and his friends that did BattleBots. And for them to do well in that while you're running a full-time job and a family and trying to stay healthy, it's like, oh, I don't know. I was actually kind of proud. Uh, like, I was not good at BattleBots because I have this thing where I'll spend so much time on the engineering and the fabrication that I will get no sleep for the driving train <laughs> or, like, the strategy for the competition. And so I'll just be running yeah. on adrenaline and stupidity, and I'll, I'll do – I mean, this is <laughs> a class I took in school. It was the same. It was an unmanned search and mes- rescue robot, and I spent, you know, like 200 – you know, 30 man hours with my two classmates building the thing and it had like a mechanism to flip it back over if it got inverted and it had you oh, know, two sad. different lighting circuits and all this stupid nonsense. But then we were too yeah, scared to try to drive the thing and both my navigators were disagreeing with each other and I, I was a horrible driver and it just didn't work out. <laughs> so on BattleBots, I was really proud. Oh, sorry. I, I... No, I was, I was just going to uh, confirm what you're saying, how it's, yeah. it's important to know when you know, for as hungry and as innovative and as as motivated as, as someone is to do something, you also need to know when you suck at something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. Or when it's time and to just you, call it, like fucking sleep. Yeah. And, you know, there's always the next yeah. morning you can get back to it. You know, not always, yeah. but in most cases, you know, you're you're creating a false deadline because you want to be a superhuman and yeah. It's not I mean, I'm gonna be. I wanna excel at my job. I wanna excel at being a husband and a father. And I want to excel at just longevity of life so I can enjoy those things, right? Yeah. And uh, I don't care, you know, I don't need to be the best mountain biker on the trail and compare myself to Strava every time I go out biking. And I don't want to, I don't have to have the tighter group than the next guy in the firing range. And I don't have to, you know, have the best time when I hike. You know, it's just, I don't, it's just as long as I'm having fun with it and not push myself too hard. When I was going to college, uh, I was just telling my wife this, I had the mantra of, you know, I want to do very well, but I don't want to be a zombie. Like, I don't want to be, straight just to get a grade you know i, I want to actually enjoy life and i did very well either way but it was not because i was just trying to get grades it was trying i was trying to balance it out and i think that actually helps you succeed in areas that you don't realize if, you, if you're actually you know 100 committed to something 100 percent of the time you don't get a break from that you can't recharge you can't refresh you can't put 100 percent towards that your, your capacity to actually f do that effort diminishes i think and so getting those breaks of, of like mental breaks, whether it be going to have a cigar, have a nice glass of whiskey. Absolutely. I think that's all that's all important stuff. But not, I don't get paid for this, obviously, but this Basil Hayden is really good if you haven't tried it. Oh, man. It's, super, it's reasonable. I think I paid $70 for the uh, the handle. Nice. But, uh, yeah, it's one of I my I think I had that years. once. There's This was pre... Wow, By the way, was San Diego's Pittsburgh money, that's like $40 in San Diego money. <laughs> yeah, I don't even... Yeah. Um, the stuff's expensive here for sure. Well, the, it was uh, less expensive when I was in Los Angeles, at least. But yeah, they sell alcohol and wine everywhere here, and it's because it's such a state uh, income generator. That's why it, uh, booze is really cheap here. I that remember when um before I moved to Texas, I told my dad, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna take my last little paycheck and just go to Costco and load up on cases of Bullet and Jack Daniels and Knob and vodka, just and bring it. And, and I, sure enough, I I brought like. 10 cases of booze with me to Texas only to then find out that the whole time I was in Texas previous visits with my dad for hunting, I was just in these, you know, random mom and pop alcohol shops where things were more than twice the price, but the most of it, it wasn't that much more expensive. I'm like, Oh man, I just wasted all that money and have to plug it all the way across the country. 
<laughs> and then we were only there for a year, so we didn't finish it. So I had to bring most of it back to San Diego. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's rough. I still have bottles of single malt scotch from like again back in the intern at spacex days in like 2013 that i've just kept for like nine years because i stocked up (laughs) nice yeah i just uh yeah actually i just i'm on my last bottle of bullet from that purchase before i moved out of san diego the first time um so i was like i gotta replenish these things Um, yeah bullet's good that's one of my go-tos i I love cooking with their bourbon um i don't know if you're into cooking at all but it's a, it's a joy for me. I, I used to not be into it, but um, I was at a point in my life where like I, it was difficult to work on uh, building things. And so um, as a result, um, I was at a boarding school, so it was just hard to get to a lab. Yeah. And so as a result, I just threw myself into cooking, you know, and so I. I That's awesome. Yeah, it's like it's, it's, it's another creative outlet. Exactly. I mean, the, and exactly there's so many ways to express creativity and ingenuity and perfection in what you do and it's not just in technology it's sometimes in that kind of culinary arts or whatever i love my wife is such a great cook i'm so lucky i used to cook a lot for myself before i was married and then but now the thing i love she makes uh for my birthday every year is bourbon chocolate chip cookies oh that sounds so good (laughs) and they're they're amazing i mean they just they last literally like less than 10 hours before i eat the whole batch I mean, if, if she let me i'll eat them all in one sitting but she tries to pace me out a little bit um probably healthy but and still, still like instance yeah so she's good. made it with she's made it with jack daniels i think she's made it once with bullet she might have made it once with not Creek. she doesn't know that she just grabs the closest bottle right she doesn't know yeah yeah i told her hey don't grab that bottle that's that's my that's really good stuff you don't want to use that <laughs> <laughs> what's so does it still have like the bourbon undertones there but i'm guessing you, you can get yeah you get a little bit of obviously the alcohol cooks off unfortunately yeah. um, but you can get some of those elements like you know like jack has that distinguished flavor yep yeah um, I, I have the uh no sorry i'm thinking no no no. i do have, I, have, I have the jack green label here so yeah yeah so, like, so that, like that distinguished flavor from jack you can get some of those undertones and then i think she once made it with um uh, knob creek and you know you know knob creek is a little bit more of that caramelization aspect and you can kind of yeah. get some of that coming through and it's just it's just it is interesting how the, it's such a good recipe if, yeah to you to your listeners there google tro- bourbon chocolate chip cookie recipe yeah, and the, there, the key thing is the key thing that she did the last couple of times is she lets the dough sit in the fridge for a few hours before she bakes it interesting. and it makes it makes the whole difference and how soft and awesome why that is them. like I, I mean this is i'm just such a nerd i'm like could be going on you know that, that makes that i'm happen. thinking it because of the, it's, like as you're making dough and handling it the, the dough is all different temperatures from your hand versus inside versus inside versus outside but if you refrigerate it for a few hours i'm guessing it has a chance of the, yeah it's all the same temperature and all the flavors can melt together kind of like if you ever oh, make God. pasta i love making pasta that's yeah. my thing from new york obviously i mean i'll marinate a steak too you know and that'll do the same yeah. thing if you leave it there long enough and i always say sometimes a lot of pastas are better the second day even if it's leftovers because oh yeah They've had overnight to just mar- like blend all together. I mean, that's like cold and- pizza or cold Chinese food. Yeah. That, you know, it's delicious. Yeah. So that's my reason. I I tend to have a reason for things sometimes. So I can try to explain away everything. That's my flaw of being an engineer is I think I know too much. Well, I mean, likewise. <laughs> <laughs> I like, we, there's a lot of uh, game shows on now that we watch now. A lot of these trivia game shows like The Chase and. I haven't seen uh, any of this stuff but- recently. Anything, anything like worth seeing? Anything good? We like the chase. Um, it was on the Game Show Network, and they just re- did it on, I think, mainstream TV. I, I what's don't know, the bound? Like, what's the what's the premise? The whole premise is that you have three players that can play, and they answer trivia questions to build up a pot, and then you oh, have cool. to go head to head with a trivia expert. And right now, they have the guys from Jeopardy, like Ken Jennings, and uh, they're just people that dominated out. Jeopardy, and that's like their like their house robot yeah. to cro- robot wars, where you're trying to beat you know, the 600 pound thing. Exactly. And so if they end up getting more questions wrong than the chaser, then they, they get kicked out of the game. But if they can stay, they, they go on to like a final round where whatever money they've accumulated thus far, if they can beat the chaser one more time uh, and trivia questions, they get to split all that money. And so the last episode was does, really does exciting. It get, because does it get fun. amplified or they just get to keep what they already had? So it's, it's, they can based on, so say they do, they have what they call this, this round where they just answer questions for 10 grand each. Okay. And when they go up against uh, the chaser for the first time, the chaser will offer them a lower amount or a higher amount that, that dictates how more, you know, how much less margin for error they have. So they're gambling. Not, yeah, I don't, don't want to give it away to your listeners if they haven't, if they haven't seen it, but. Oh, fair, sorry. Um, I mean, I'm just speculating because I'm, 
you know, that's what I do. But like, yeah, I, I get it. I don't want to ruin that either. Yeah. So it's just really good. And and but watching shows like that, like, and it's amazing how little I do know about stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and like, anytime there's any pop culture question that comes up, like a, a pop star or you know, I don't know that stuff. I do horrible at trivia nights at bars because yeah. I, I don't know any of that. I go to my wife. Oh, this is your question. I don't know anything about Beyonce or Miley Cyrus or yeah. the, the well, royal did you family. see Miley Cyrus's Rogan interview? Like she was surprisingly down to earth. Like she struck me as just a person you'd want to hang out with. No, I, I have not. Um, I never would. I, I never would have painted myself a Miley Cyrus fan. But I just listened to her talk. And I'm like, this is just a normal fucking person, you know? Like the funny thing, I think it might be her. That recently I listened to um, Hard Rock a lot, and. It might be her. It might be someone else that they just did a cover of Metallica. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, oh man, which I can't remember. I, yeah, I, I, I should have been better prepared for this interview. No, it's um, all. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna cover Metallica. Go to Miley Cyrus. And, better and talk about that cookie it, recipe. <laughs> I think. Um, a little gun it play. wasn't the same man and but I was, i'm doing my work and i'm like okay this is a metallica song but that is a female voice singing it and it was actually surprisingly pretty good and i looked over at the at the sirius xm um not the plug them but that's what i listened to mostly yeah. and i saw it and i'm like does that say myrie cyrus i'm like what? <laughs> i was like what the heck is this there's an engineer i work with uh who has, he was actually on the first episode of this podcast his name's dan curran and back when we were in school together this would have been like a decade ago or more um he did the most amazing cover of Britney Spears Toxic. Like it was, it was so, it was, it was a heavy metal cover of Britney Spears Toxic. And he would just pull it out of parties. It was fucking hilarious. And, and just, it, it was actually really appealing. Like I'm not even a, really a huge metal fan or a huge Britney Spears fan, but for some reason hearing him saying that just made me happy. Yeah, no, I'm definitely big into metal, uh, hard rock. Um, and the funny thing is I, I, my buddy that I hike with every week, you know, he's, and so he plays his guitar and everything. And I admittedly have zero musical talent. Same. I, I tried zero. keyboard so much as a kid and I just sucked at it consistently. I mean, the most I can claim is I played trumpet when I was in fourth, fifth grade and I quit because it was so bad. Yeah, <laughs> just, I found my dad's trumpet in the closet, made some horrible fart <laughs> sounds. All the adults just took it away from me. And <laughs> it's the end of that. And so that's, yeah. So that's one of those things where I admit I have total lack of capability of, but I love listening to music and I love what music does. Uh, for Same. the energy and during work and for working out. Yeah, um, absolutely. Just, so, yeah. It's, so, what do you, so you listen to Hard Rock, you said? Uh, personally, I mean, I'm into a lot of different kinds of I really like the Wu-Tang Clan uh, from your hometown of Staten yeah, Island. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, not the classic. I, I used to listen to that as well growing up. I mean, that was... That's uh, Ghostface is pretty amazing. I found an album with Ghostface Killer uh, and like a Canadian jazz band. I think it was Bad Not Good. I might be getting that wrong. I but, forget. I think it was. It might be him lately. They're coming, like they're getting back out there and exposing himself and doing other things. I forget who it was, and it might it might be Ghostface that I remember recently hearing about just recently getting involved in. Others. I'm like, well, that's not a, a a relationship I would have expected to hear. It was one of those trivia shows. I think it was the Chase where they said who so did this, and it was the answer was Ghost. I'm like, what the heck, Ghost? I'm like, really? <laughs> The fact that somebody knew that, like, is amazing, you know, because that's so yeah. eclectic yeah. out there. I mean, you know, like, I think Old Dirty Bastard is hilarious. I I, I don't, I, I don't know. He's an interesting character because he's so insane that you kind of just want to watch that train go off the rails. But, like, <laughs> at the same time, you know, you're just like, I, I don't know if I ever want to be like this guy in any way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, just a really nice guy from the Wu-Tang. Like, I, I went to one of his shows, and he gave me, like, three fist bumps, which is me way overreaching. No shit, and that's just pretty being cool. an incredibly nice guy, you know, and, and you know, I'll, I'll always I mean, and speak nicely of him. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, these guys, these guys were geniuses and what they've done, yeah. and, and uh, I think and it's impressive. they all impressive. have good I mean, solo careers. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. And there's people, so they're still, in a way, they're still relevant in, in a lot of ways today. Oh, of it's like, I mean, yeah, it's just it's really impressive what they can do and, and how they they just kind of I think just you know their passion and their dedication to what they do is it, pretty it impressive. All comes it's very good at it. Yeah. yeah. See what else am I into? Um, I like a lot of blues, uh, some jazz. I like blues when I cook. I like jazz when I eat. Um, I don't know. Um, pretty cool. Been listening to a lot of country lately, so like Hank Williams, uh, Hank Three. Uh, yeah, like all the Hanks. Uh, Hank too, yeah, not as I, much. 
I'll tell you what, nothing beats listening to country music when you're doing a long road trip. Oh, yeah. For oh, yeah, some absolutely. reason. I mean, when I'm doing a long road trip, I want to put on country music. It's just, just being on the I, open highway. Have you listened to Wheeler Walker Jr.? What's that? Have you listened to a guy named Wheeler Walker Jr.? I don't know. I don't know the names. I don't know who they are. It's, it's pretty funny. So he's got he's got this song, and I hesitate to even say this, but it's called Eating Pussy and Kicking Ass. And it's <laughs> it's hilarious. The guy was a comedian before he was... He was a country singer, uh, but he's a really good country singer. And I found him on like a Spotify. I was listening to a Johnny Cash playlist and he just came on. Okay, that, that reminds me of a very vulgar, hysterical parody country singer called Scuzz Twitley. Scuzz Twitley. Yeah. Okay, I got to remember this guy. Yeah. I, I apologize now to all your listeners that are going to Google <laughs> him and look him up because it is, it is hysterical and offensively bad. It's, <laughs> it's great. I mean, it's just simple funny and it's just he like he wants to be the charlie sheen of country music basically oh, yeah. Gets, <laughs> yeah for sure real walker jr is like that like i can't listen to that with my wife in the car she'll she'll look at me like i'm getting out <laughs> <laughs> i played it i played it for my dad who was an all-timer navy guy born and raised in brooklyn and uh you know mine permanently in the gutter kind of guy and uh i mean he just yeah. loved it that's awesome. He loves it. I've showed real to people at work. I, I've played it at bars and like nobody's heard it playing. Like I'll like put it on the like the list. Um I mean he's so funny. He was he was on Joe Rogan and he had this bit where he was um apparently like Donald Cowboy Cerrone uh was singing Eating Pussy and Kicking Ass for a karaoke thing. And he <laughs> called up Real Walker Jr.'s cell phone. I was like, Hey, can I sing the song? He's like, Yeah, yeah, go for it, man, you know. <laughs> 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 it's super, super cool so yeah, I, it's I, funny during my uh my college years i used to i used to my first few years in college i used to love listening to classic classical music when i'd study so, uh, vivaldi's uh i really like mozart yeah. um i've actually yeah, been like that, a yeah. blast lately to be honest which, yeah it's a little bit atonal but i don't know there's something to be said for it and then i always did like hard rock but then what was happening the funniest thing was my buddy in college uh my buddy anthony we actually had the same birthday and uh, his family was a bunch of private pilots. So we had a bitch in 21st birthday. I'll, I can get to that later. Sure. But what's funny was one day he was in the lab studying and I told him I'll meet him there to study. And he was in there already and he was listening to like Metallica or, or Tool or something like that. Nice. And, oh, I'm like, I love your music, dude. He's like, but I can't listen to it while studying. And he's like, what? Why not? Have you tried it? And I'm like, honestly, no, I haven't tried it. Let me dude. do it. And it was amazing how it just brought a whole different energy to my that's, studying that's sessions. Awesome compared to like classical which is great i mean if i'm going to read a textbook i gotta listen to classical if i'm, if I'm cramming for an exam or when i was cramming for exams, like the tupac was always my battle anthem and like yeah. for a while, it's, it's like, like that guy in succession, succession where like he's going to a music, music and just listening to like hardcore hip-hop hip -hop. <laughs> yeah like I, I would listen to just the just the angriest gangster rap i could find because like that you know that's why i fucked your bitch you fat motherfucker <laughs> so, yeah, i better get this better I get this just all that I just saw that show two days ago, the first episode. I know what you're talking about now. I was able to knock out that reference with Secession. Yeah, yeah, it's good, right? But we just only saw the one episode yet. We're probably going to start episode two tonight. It's a great um, show, man. I think, I think you'll, you'll like it. it. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, it was so weird how, like, I just, and, like, ever since then, I just, I never, like, like I said, reading a textbook, sure, I'll, I'll listen to classical. And then, but now I just listen to hard rock all the time. Yeah, I did a lot of him in grad school. school. Um, like yeah. he, he's, he's really good. good. I mean, just the set, set of pipes that guy's got. got. Yeah. Yeah. And then working out definitely is all hardcore heavy metal. Oh, oh for, for sure. sure. Yeah, I, I could see that. that. I, I still do a lot of, I do a lot of gangster rap. rap. Uh, but but Slipknot was my whole childhood. I mean, Marilyn Manson. Yeah, Blood Bane. Yeah. Yeah, some good stuff. Yeah, it's good to have a good diverse musical interest. I think so too. I mean, because. I always, I always say, like, anybody, anybody that says I don't like country music needs to listen to Hank Williams. Anybody that says I don't like rap needs to listen to Wu-Tang Clan. You know, I mean, uh, there's there's redeeming music everywhere. I mean, and, and you just got to go. Like, there's there's one band I really like that's that's less known. Um, and you got to remind me after this about that that country band you talked about. because I'll have to email you. when I, Next time Please. it comes on, I'm going to I'm gonna email you. And, and one I'd like to remind you of is um, there is – tip my tongue – all right, it's gone. I'm sorry. It swam away. But there was uh, there was one there for a moment that was um, oh the Blue Vipers of Brooklyn. So it's uh, it's like a jazz band I really like, and they do a lot of like Dixieland type stuff. And um, 
you know, it's just, it's really soulful. It's, it's, uh, it's really good. Like, I think their, their guy that does percussion is from the Netherlands and he just huh. wears like thimbles on his fingers and he has like a washboard and he is oh, wow. super talented. Really little tech. But yeah, but they're, they're genius. I mean, like, you know, they're just yeah. really, really good musicians and, and had a phase with that for a while. So that was, that was that's pretty stuff. cool. Yeah. Like I say, I mean, music is what got me into engineering because I was, you know, and I think it's, there's like an appreciation there for, and I always wanted to learn the audio stuff when I was um, my senior project with my buddy, Anthony, the one that we share the same birthday. Um, we actually did a digital equalizer. Oh, cool. And, and it was one of the first, like the school had never done that before. So we were the first ones in the school to do it. We won a prize for it at our school. When you say kind of digital coincide. equalizer, you mean like microcontrollers? You mean like discrete? Like how did? How yeah, it was work? actually it was a digital signal processor before oh. NVIDIA was even known. That's awesome. Um, had I known then to invest in NVIDIA? <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ! What are they up to now? Like seven hundred a share? Like, seven and change was the last I saw. Yeah, I, I shouldn't have gotten out of that. Um, but you know, you live, and that's what happens. Yeah, it was. It was a. I remember. It's amazing. It's amazing the details you can remember. It was a Motorola DSP fifty six K series. The thing is basically like one one thousandth of strength of the power of something now. Yeah, yeah. And, but I mean, the stuff that's come out in the last three years has been just. Yeah. I mean, it, it, we would have shit bricks hearing about this. I mean, there's, they just wouldn't have been feasible any any sooner yeah. in history. Well, we tried to do ten band because my buddy Anthony, I trusted him. He was into music. He said, "Oh, there's no such thing that's out there as a, as a ten band digital equalizer. You got the analog ones." And he's like, "We should do this." I'm like, "Okay, cool. Let's try it." The processor couldn't handle it. Were you doing just FFTs or like how did you? Category. Yeah, it was basically it was, yeah, it was basically doing that. It was a combination of uh, fast Fourier transform. If you're listening, it's a yeah, way to yeah, find no, different frequencies of sound and categorize. But sorry, I made to digress. No, you're fine. Um, and it was funny because it was underpowered for what we were trying to do. It could only do I think four channels out of ten we were trying to do, but we were able to demo that. Have three of them in parallel, or would that not have been an option at the time? We were still had we still had other classes <laughs> that we were trying nice. to get done. <laughs> And ours was one, again one of the only projects that worked, so we we kind of we won the project award, so we were happy yeah, about that. That doesn't happen very often in school. And it's funny. So right in 2018, before we decided we were going to go to Texas, I was still at Qualcomm. I was talking to one of the guys from Altera, and they were just transitioning to Intel. Interesting. And I said, "Hey, just real quick, what's can I get one of your eval boards? Like, where can I buy one of your eval boards? I want to try to redo my senior project." you know, and re re revamp it because I had recently come across my project report and I was trying to read it through it again. I'm like, man, I, I didn't even understood what I wrote. Like it was so far removed from the oh, well, I mean, you get into that mentality yeah. where you're just trying to win and I feel like your brain detaches a little bit. Well, I mean, like it's there, but you're firing on all cylinders trying to do a thing. You're like, how did I do that? Or what was I even thinking? I know, it's so crazy. I was, I was trying to read my own project report from 20 years ago. I'm like, man, I can't even understand what I did anymore. I'm like, I need to, I need to bring it back. I need to bring it back up and so i wanted to try and do it again and uh then we ended up decided to move so all those things just kind of got put on hold and but yeah it's one of those things where um the yeah, audio is what kind of got me into engineering it's awesome and uh, just the love and passion for it and to understand it, i think is really you know it's really pretty pretty crazy like there's so much science and art in music it, it really bridges everything i, I think. completely so, agree yeah Cool. I mean, it's empathy. I mean, it's it's human emotion, psychology. It's it's a lot of stuff, and and just raw expression of of what you're feeling. You know. And I, I love how, um, like, just hearing a particular song can elicit so many memories and emotions of something, an experience in the past. Yeah, I mean, serotonin like this, goes up sometimes, like with certain certain tracks. Yeah. Like I just, there's like certain songs that, like, if I hear a certain song from like Alice in Chains or Audio Slave or Taproot, like these are bands from like my, you know, from the early 2000s. It just, it, yeah. I can instantly be transported back to that time and place when I first heard that Maybe song. Maybe we did Foreign was... and Slipknot. One of my friends played the bagpipes, yeah. you know, like in school, I was friends yeah. with the skater kids. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's cool. just, it's just so cool how it, how it can bring you back there. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So I do think it's my son's bath time. I hear the tub going. No problem at all. Is there anything you want to plug? Uh, well, well, before we call this, anything you want to talk about? Anything you want to call attention to? Um, just like I said, you know, I think for, for any of you listeners that just you know are young that want to figure out what they need to do, just you know, just keep at it. Really, I don't, I don't think I need to. I don't want to plug anything specifically. 
Yeah. Um, for your older listeners that are, are involved in the industry and trying to do anything drones and robotics, you know, check out our, our company, Moto AI. Uh, you know, we have that uh, DOD compliance for being built in the USA. That's, a, that's something I'm proud of. I'm an American patriot, so I'm really kind of yeah. proud that we do that. Um, it's beautiful to see that still going on. I mean, you know, there's been yeah. so much stuff that's been offshore. It's cool to see. Yeah, it's huge opportunities, and I think we, we, you know, we make some really killer stuff. I mean, we're and we have a lot of awesome stuff that I've been working on that I can't talk about yet that I'm excited that, you know, we'll be able to hang our head on that as well. And, and to know that, you know, we've had some of the, you know, we're, we're going to do some uh, world's best soon out of our little company. And, and I'm excited for that. I'll be keeping my eyes open. Vinny, thanks for coming on. Really you appreciate it. you, man. Thanks, Spencer. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. If you've stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.